Okay, we're going to deal with PREA this morning, which is the Prison Rape Elimination Act. It's a federal um, federal law, federal act, and we implement it on the state level as well. Um, and in order for us, the thinking is, in order for us to really understand what transpired uh, in the process at the Chittenden facility, as all the other facilities. I really don't want us to forget that there is four other facilities, four or five other facilities. Uh, so this is for the whole correctional system. Um, we really need to understand what we have on the books here in Vermont for PREA, for sexual assaults, inmate, inmate, staff to staff, staff to inmate. We also need to understand with DOC their directives and policies because a lot of our statutes get carried out in the DOC through their directives. And that's different than the administrative rules process. It's more of an internal process. There is public input uh, on those directives, but it's very different than our administrative rules process. So um, we need to know what's in place now in terms of PREA, um, and that's what I wanted to spend time first with Eric to go through what's in state statute uh, that pertains to this, and then we'll transition to DOC to work more internally with our policies and directives. Does that make sense for folks? Yeah. All right. Welcome, Eric. Thank you. A new year. Yes, new yes. Good morning, everybody. Same issues, different issues. Yes, right. Well, it's nice to see everybody. Obviously, it's my first time in here this year. And it's, uh, I'll be your last. <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure that. But it's good to see everybody, and happy new year. Um, I know. Look at this. So which one do we want to put up here? Uh, you mean of the different? I know that there's a lot of documents. I should point out as sort of a caveat that uh, I literally uh, <laughs> had never read a word of this act before preparing for this testimony, so I have no doubt that uh, um, there will be many questions that the department's experts will be far more able to answer than I will, but I was able to um, uh, review the act pretty thoroughly, some of the other resources that are connected to the act, and I think come up with at least a good foundation for you folks to understand it. You may all, probably all are more familiar with it than I am. Um, but it certainly was interesting since I'd never read it before. <laughs> and uh, when was some of it put in place? Pardon me. When was some of this put in place? It was originally passed in 2003. So the federal law was passed in 2003. It was signed by President uh, George W. Bush, September 4th of that year. So, so did we have anything on the books prior to that? Not that I'm aware of. But I, I didn't research that issue as to what it, we have in Vermont. Um, it would be interesting because I remember back when I was on the committee as vice chair, and it was back in the late mid to late 90s, I introduced a bill huh. about sexual assault within correctional facilities mm -hmm. for uh, inmate um, correctional officers on inmates. That we do, we do have a specific statute yeah. on the books that prohibits. Uh, so when was that put in? Do you know? I want to say 2005. Okay, so it's later 2006. 2006. Right. So I did this back in the late 90s. Oh, I interesting. I don't think it passed completely. It passed out of here. Right. It Obviously, it took some time to yeah. for it to get on the books, but it is now and has been 2006, I guess. Right. The. Yeah. Uh, well, it was probably about 10 years later that it got on the books. Right. Right. It's in the middle. Somewhere. So the federal statute uh, was bipartisan. It was passed by unanimous consent of both the House and the Senate in uh, July of 2003, signed by President George Bush a couple of months later. And according to the U.S. Department of Justice, uh, sort of the big picture, the overarching goal of it is to, er quote, eradicate prisoner rape in all types of correctional facilities in this country. Obviously an ambitious goal. That's what DOJ has set down as the goal. And if we look at, at, at the PREA itself, which, uh, the language is in one of the links that I'm not sure how ever, they have their links on their iPads as well. Mm -hmm. We got that yes. at work, so yeah, it's on our webpage. Oh, great! And, and individually, you can look yeah. at it, pull mm -hmm. it up yeah, if you we want have to. The same thing. Perfect. Um, so, within the act itself, that it actually uh, states quite explicitly what the purposes are in section 30,302, right there. Take a quick look at them. Stab. You'll see there's uh, nine of them. 
This, and the first one is to establish a zero tolerance standard for the incidence of prison rape in prisons in the United States. It's a zero tolerance standard. Number two, make the prevention of prison rape a top priority in each prison system. Develop and implement national standards. And this phrase is crucial because you'll see it reappear throughout the act. Uh, for the detection, prevention, reduction, and punishment of prison rape. So that seems to be a theme that recurs during the language of the act as well. Uh, number four, increase the available data and information on the incidence of prison rape, consequently improving the management and administration of correctional facilities. You'll see that theme come up as well. Um, standardized definitions used for collecting data. Increase accountability of prison officials who fail to detect, prevent, reduce, and punish. There's that phrase again, prison rape. Um, protect the Eighth Amendment rights of federal, state, and local prisoners. You may recall the Eighth Amendment is in the federal constitution that uh, exactly cruel and unusual punishment. So again, it's concerned with that as well. Increase efficiency and effectiveness of expenditures through grant programs. You see, that's one of the. I'm going to say for a second what I think the four highlights of the act itself are. Grant programs is one of them, and finally, reduce costs that prison rape imposes on interstate commerce. That's just sort of a, a shoehorn for federal for the federal government to enact legislation and when they say it's something that affects interstate commerce that provides a federal groundwork for a federal basis, I should say, for Congress to enact a law. So uh, how did the PRAEA propose to accomplish this goal of eradicating prison rape? I think, and we'll go to each one of these issues, but there's four that I saw, and fortunately, uh, you'll see when we come to the standards on this, that the rules that were proposed, or that actually are final now, from the Department of Justice and the Attorney Generals on this, because much of the substance of what the standards are, if not all of it, is in the rule, as opposed to the, the statute rules. itself, the federal rule. Federal exactly. rules, not state rules. Correct. Federal. Yes. Yes. That's where the substantive standard is, and that rule is 128 pages long, single spaced, three columns. It is huge. Wow. Here, now, it's, it's visually, it's interesting. Just, and it was published originally in the. Uh, in the Federal Register as, um, as, uh, uh, yeah, there it is. See, there it is. And, uh, as, that's where Federal rules are initially published. They're ultimately codified in what's known as CFR, the Code of Federal Regulations. But before that, they all get published in the Federal Register. That's the first public appearance that they make. And this was the DOG's rule on, um, on the PREA. Lengthy, very dense. Um, fortunately, you'll see in the top right column there, DOG gave us an executive summary. <laughs> so that was very helpful. Um, but before we get to the register real quick, I want to touch on, because that is the substantive standards of what um, the PREA authorized and what was eventually implemented by rule. But there's a couple of other things that the PREA did uh, in addition to the standard, and, and the three of them are, I'll just say, before I touch on each one individually, information, I'm sorry. <laughs> Hello. So that's information gathering and dissemination, number one. Education and training. Uh, yes, it is. Number two. Distributing grants, number three. And these national standards, number four. So there's four things. Information, uh, education and training, grants, and standards. So as far as the... Uh, the uh, information the gathering goes, you'll see that the, the act basically says, as we it says to the uh, Department of Justice's is, Bureau is of Justice Statistics, BJS, and they are right here. You see the second thing down here? This is their PREA page. And all these different federal agencies, interesting, this is obviously a okay. significant act Thank that brings in a lot of a lot of federal work as well as state work. There's, all these federal agencies have their own PREA pages with various resources. <laughs> Um, this one is the one from the Bureau of Justice Statistics, and what they have to do under the Act um, is they have to basically collect data. They have to, for, for each calendar year, they have to come up with a comprehensive statistical review and analysis of the incidents and effects of prison rape. So they have to collect all this data, and you'll see on the right-hand side of this page in the column on the right there, you'll see the data, for example, from the last three years. There's PREA data collection 2019, 2018, 2017, kind of down the right side. So this federal agency is charged with collecting and um, disseminating all this data. And the idea is, well, if all this data, this accurate data, is given out to uh, the folks who actually work in 
facilities, then that will provide them with the ability to reduce prison rate. They have accurate data on how it happens. And, so, um, Eric, yeah. just for clarification, this data that they're receiving yes. is from all the states? It's, yeah. It's and not just federal states. prisons. It's Correct. state, but it's only those facilities that the state owns and operates. Actually, or no, is it not all necessarily. Facilities? Is yeah. it like your county facilities yeah. and is it your private prisons? Yes. Yeah. All those things are true. So it's really dependent in terms of how accurate the state is in collecting the data. <clears throat> yeah. You certainly the, 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 the data itself has to be accurate in order for the information they sort of conclude about from the data to be accurate as well. Right. For sure. Is it voluntary or the the sending in of the data is it voluntary? No. Well, that's an interesting point. The the uh, the way it works is that the reason that states are subject to this federal law or can choose to be subject can choose to yes. be subject. Yes. Yes. Um, the way it works is that, and you've seen this in other areas. I think in this committee, we see it in the Judiciary Committee a lot. The feds will set up a law and say, okay. Um, the way it works is you don't have to comply with this to the states, but if you don't comply, you're going to lose 5% of your grant funding. But if you don't get many grants. It could, that's right. And sometimes for just, I think of one example at the top of my head, for, where, where the state, for example, has chosen not to comply with the federal law and, and has chosen to forego the money, is the, um, the primary seatbelt enforcement, for example. There's some federal money associated with that that Vermont has chosen to forego because as a policy matter, it uh, uh, at least so far, the legislature has chosen to not have primary enforcement of seatbelts. However, other times, legislator, the legislature will make the different weighing of the positive, the, the benefits and the, the upside and the downside. And this, from my understanding, I think the DLC will be able to talk about this a lot more as to uh, how long they've chosen to to get involved in this program. But it's not required. You could chip. You could say five percent. I think the language that's used is. Money and I can quote you the language, but it's five percent of the um, five percent of federal grant money they would otherwise receive for prison purposes. So and I think that's burn grant probably and and right like second chance act. Okay, right. No, actually the second chance act is not one of the SAMHSA grants. I think so. So how many states are not, did not incorporate Korea? The know? last list, I couldn't find it, uh, 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 the last list I could see was 2017, and at that time, 20, the roughly 20 states had complied. So actually, it was most half. But that was, that was almost three years ago now, so I, I'm not. Not even half. At least then. And it would be interesting where geographically those states were. Right. Or yeah. Is it on the coast, huh. east and west? Is it north? Is it yeah. midwest, south? That's an interesting question. Let me try. I don't have that list right here, but I'll try I think it down. the midwest and yeah. the south probably did not comply. Felicia? Quick question stemming off of that. Do we know if uh, the facility in Mississippi, where of course the, the talent had yeah, are they in compliance with PREA? Anyone here? Well, Do they up. comply with PREA? Mm -hmm. Where mm -hmm. out of state down in Mississippi? It's part of their contract. It's part of their oh, okay. contract. Okay. So and whether or not the state complies with the contract. Mm -hmm. and, and per the federal PREA standards, we cannot engage in a contract with someone who is not willing to be in compliance. Okay. So if they weren't, we would have to end the contract in order to be federally compliant. Mm -hmm. The, does ACA accreditation require PREA? That's who? ACA accredita accreditation. ACA. Association of Correctional. Correctional. Mm -hmm. And you said yes. Or did somebody say yes? Yeah, it, it okay. does. It's, it is a good portion of all of those ASCA meetings or contractors meetings, including assurances. Representative Evans, you were asking just to also you're getting at this question of whether it, you know what state what facilities are actually mm -hmm. encompassed by this is it okay. county jails, you know uh, private companies and that uh, comes from the term 
the definition of the term prison in the Act, which you see definition number seven, for purposes of the Act, prison means any confinement facility of a federal, state, or local government, so that captures county stuff as well, local government, whether administered by such government or by a private organization on behalf of such government, and includes local jails, police lockups, juvenile oh. facilities, etc. So it sweeps very broadly. Even Woodside. Yeah. yeah. There's a whole thing on juvenile. Yeah. And sort of going off that definition, when you go back to the, uh, to the, um, to the standards and the rule, you'll see when DOJ put the rule forth, they said some two very similar things. I'm on page 37107 of the rule. If you look at the top, third column to the right, very top first paragraph, the standards contained in this final rule apply to facilities operated by or on behalf of state and local governments and the Department of Justice. Cool. Similar statement over in the in the first column, which is an interesting one, and this goes to the, the 5% uh, point that I was just making about how states can choose to forego compliance with this if they also want to forego 5% of their grant money. There's this process that I think DOC will probably talk a little bit more about that I'm not that familiar with, but if I understand it correctly, the governor or the executive branch somehow has to certify annual compliance with the act. And so kind of going off that point, you'll see this second sentence in there in that first paragraph. A state whose governor does not certify full compliance with the standards is subject to the loss of 5% of any DOJ grant funds that it would otherwise receive for prison purposes unless the governor submits an assurance that this 5% will be used only for the purposes of enabling the state to achieve full compliance in the future. So you can sort of do it that way, too. We'll do it now, or we'll set 5% aside and we'll comply down the road. <laughs> and that second sentence there, <coughs> the final rule specifies that the governor's certification applies to all facilities in the state under the operational control of the state's executive branch, including facilities operated by private entities on behalf of the state's executive branch. Want to see that? So it, it yeah. sweeps very broadly, includes really just about every conceivable facility. Oh, yes. So, Eric. I'm wondering if PREA only applies to incarcerated individuals, not to individuals under the control of the Department of Corrections. Like paroles and Parolees, furloughs. furloughs, probationers, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, I, that's an interesting question. Um, I, I don't want to answer it without knowing 100% clearly. I mean, DOC might. Well, it says the standards contained in this final rule apply to facilities operated by. So if you're on furlough and parole, you're not in a facility. That was my thinking, but I'm not 100% sure. That's, it, it definitely seems to be geared toward uh, someone who is, in, is within a... So, and, and I asked the question because of the situation we have going on now. Right, yes. uh, it, uh, it, you know, it doesn't apply, and I'm sure you guys will talk about that. Uh, uh, people that are on the outside, mm -hmm. then what protections do those folks have right. uh, that are there? They were afforded while they were incarcerated, right? Uh, protections or recourse or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, yeah. That same statute you were mentioning earlier, the Vermont statute that prohibits uh, sexual conduct between certain DOC employees and. Uh, inmates or people subject to their supervision. That does apply, actually, to not just within the facility. There's a piece of that that applies to, I think, probationers, people on furlough, um, but it has to be somebody under the direct supervision of that person. So it can't just be someone who happens to work in DOC and someone who's not supervising that that's, person. That's a, that's a big deal. Which said. one? That it's not the direct? Direct supervision. Yes. Because if I'm a PMP person and I engage in a unlawful act yeah. with, a with a former inmate, but they're not under my direct supervision. Then what? Uh, if, was, if it's, you mean it's consensual? Let's assume it's consensual. Well, it's, it's consensual. It, that's right. that was the point of the legislation <laughs> that right. I introduced back then. That if if there is a offender inmate and there was a correctional officer staff, there is no consent. Right. It's not consensual because of the power divide. So that's what it, the legislation sure. that I worked on looked at was that issue of consent because if you're under the control of someone else, 
-hmm. Consent doesn't really matter. <clears throat> yes, that's exactly right, and uh, that's what that's the the. Um, that's the slide center. Yeah, okay. But. And, and, and Alice, I ask a lot of these because I think pre is a, a, a good thing from what I've learned of it over, over, over through my experience is, is us being part of that is, is a good thing to have happen. But it, I don't want to give us a feel good right. attitude when people leave the facility that we're, we've done all we can do or people are still protected by PREA. And uh, so it gets to be into an area that we have to talk about now. Yeah, and you will, I'm trying to pull up the statute, but I'm not having much luck with this, so uh, um, we're going to skip it for now. But I think it's uh, Title 13, 3257 or something like that, which is the, which is the statute on, that prohibits sexual conduct between DOC uh, employees and uh, people who are subject to their supervision. But interestingly, as you mentioned, Representative Emmons, if it's a person who's in the facility, I don't think the supervisory role, if I remember the language right, doesn't matter. So it's, it's any any sexual contact if they're in the facility. If it's, on, it's only with respect to the probationers, furloughees, parolees, those folks, that it has to be a person in a supervisory role um, before you're in a situation where con, you know consent doesn't matter because, as you say, it's the power imbalance sort of behind that. Um, so getting back to uh, PREA for uh, a moment, we talked about uh, the information gathering, a couple other. Uh, components of the act before we get to the standards themselves. Uh, there's also education and training, and this is done by the National Institute of Corrections. You see, they also, we just looked at the Bureau of Justice Statistics webpage. This is the National Institute of Corrections, also has a PREA um, webpage. Uh, you'll see here it is. They have uh, all sorts of resources on the right. You see what they're, they're charged with doing under PREA is to establish a national clearinghouse. That's the language it's using. National Clearinghouse for the provision of information and assistance to federal, state, and local authorities responsible for the prevention, investigation, and punishment of prison rape. So, this is their one of their, their main web page. You see the this clearinghouse on the right. There's resources. There's educational materials, uh, related resources, contact folks. It sort of breaks it down by probation, prisons, jails, uh, various topics. Um, so again, the idea is. Uh, with all this information available, that hopefully the dissemination of accurate information will uh, actually result in the reduction of the actual commission of these crimes. Uh, the second thing that uh, NIC is tasked with doing is to conduct training and education. You see, there was that, you can't quite see the whole thing, but on the, the top right there, that is, uh, if I were to move that, maybe that will well, anyway, within that box, it does say education. <laughs> so that's sort of their connection to their education resources as well. And uh, all right, lastly, before we get to the standards, just wanted to mention for a moment, the last member I mentioned there was education, information dissemination, and grants. So another federal uh, uh, department, which is the uh, Bureau of Justice Assistance, which is responsible for giving out a lot of federal money in criminal justice areas, um, they are the folks who have the PREA grant program. They also have a PREA page and a website uh, that gives information about how states can get grants from them. They are charged with uh, basically um, distributing federal money, federal grant money, in order to protect and safeguard inmates, particularly from prison rape, and to safeguard the communities to which inmates return, is the language that's used in the statute. So those are the three other main points other than the standards themselves. Next, we're talking about the big picture. What's this act doing? You know, it's giving money. Providing education and assistance, it's trying to distribute information all through various federal agencies, and then lastly, uh, perhaps most importantly, the um, it establishes these standards. And uh, if you look at the act itself for a moment, uh, under 307A, I believe it is, um, this basically says to the attorney general that they have to. It's going to come back to the. Uh, um, <coughs> To that phrase that I mentioned in the very beginning. Let's see, we're right there. So, final rule. This is the standards. This is from the statute itself in A1. Uh, it didn't make the one year deadline, actually, it took several years because it's a very complex project, I'm sure. But it does say that uh, um, the Attorney General shall publish a final rule adopting national standards for the detection, 
prevention, education, and punishment of prison rape. So it charges the AG with developing this rule. And it established what's known, what it called the National <coughs> Prison Rape Elimination Commission. I think that was actually in the previous section. But the, the law also establishes this commission, National Prison Rape Elimination Commission. And the, the uh, charge of that commission was to make recommendations on what these standards were going to be. So the commission makes recommendations on the standards to the Attorney General's office. They did that in 2009. And at that point, the commission disbanded because it had fulfilled its duty. And then this, as we saw in the beginning, this final rule became effective in 2012. So if you think about the timing of the act, it took a long time, right? The act passed in 2003. That commission proposed their rules in 2009, and the rule wasn't finalized to 2012. So obviously, a lot of work and study went into this. Um, I already mentioned earlier that the, that the standards in this rule uh, apply to states as well as the federal government, county jails, private uh, prisons that are connected with the state, and the point about the, uh, in a sense, the state having the option whether to comply or not, if they choose, they prefer to forego that 5% of federal funding. Um, so that's kind of the, the, the background. The substance of the rule itself, there's, there's a lot to it. As I mentioned, it's, you know, lengthy, very detailed. So I tried to, using the executive summary that the Department of Justice provided, um, kind of get some of the highlights of it for you. I'm sure I'll probably miss some of them, which I'm happy to be uh, supplemented on. But uh, just to go through a few things that are that are within the rule, um, and I'll just sort of I can sort of go through them. Sort of, with sort of I'm conscious of, of the time here. No, well, go ahead. No, you've got plenty of time. Unless okay. you have to be somewhere. Um, no, I'm good. But I know that there's other no, folks. No, we're fine. Okay. We're so, fine. Um, so yeah, what are what are some of the highlights of the substantive pieces? of what's in the actual rule. First one is general prevention planning. Pull up the rule here. Uh, and under prevention planning, it says uh, the general point, a couple of general points here. Each agency and facility has to designate a PREA point person. And uh, I don't know if maybe there's one in the room. I would be surprised. <laughs> uh, that's interesting. It's in the statute itself that, that requires a PREA point person, and it uses the language sufficient time and authority to coordinate compliance efforts. So that's in the statute. Uh, and again, it's an idea of prevention. comes under the topic of prevention planning. Also under the prevention planning topic is a background checks issue, as well as hiring uh, and promoting. So it says that facilities can't hire or promote people who have committed sexual abuse that's a big point. Can't hire or promote people who committed sexual abuse. And they have to perform background checks on prospective and current employees. So that, again, you think about that. That makes sense in a prevention planning concept, because the idea is we are doing some prevention if you're not hiring people who have been convicted of this, of this before, which you can find out by conducting a, a background check. Another, so that's prevention planning. Another one, supervision and monitoring. Another big, a big point theme that comes out of the supervision and monitoring. Each facility must have what they call a staffing plan. Staffing plan provides for adequate levels of staffing and where applicable video monitoring to protect inmates against sexual abuse. So staffing and where applicable video monitoring to protect inmates against sexual abuse. And all agencies have to do, this is also under the supervision and monitoring, an annual assessment. So an annual assessment is required to determine whether they need to make any adjustments to their staffing plan or to the, the deployment of technologies to prevent sexual abuse. So we've got prevention planning, supervision, monitoring. Third thing, training and education. Training and education. Uh, standards require staff training. Staff training on key topics related to preventing, detecting, responding to sexual abuse. Screening, another big picture theme. Inmates have to be screened to determine who's at risk of being sexually abused or sexually abusive. No, sexually abused or sexually abusive, and that requires screening. A screening must be used also, according to the rule, screening information must be used to inform housing, bed, work, education, and program assignments. Interesting. Who does the screening? Uh, it says that the agencies and facilities, as far as who specifically, the DOC would probably be able to answer that question, but, but the rule says 
agencies and facilities have to do it. I don't know who, which individuals are assigned. But. Uh, Felicia? Um, is the screening done more than once to kind of adjust with prison population, length of sentence, mm -hmm. or is it done kind of on intake and then put in a drawer? That's a very good question. I don't know the answer to it, but uh, I didn't see anything in the rule about that specific point. This is federal. Point. Correct. This is all federal. Right. And the states have to comply with this. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so then it's up to the state, i.e. the Department of Corrections, in their directives, I would assume, then carries out how they comply with this federal rule. That's my thinking at this point. Am I off base on that? So there is no administrative rules process that you have gone through for this. It's all internally within your directives. There are guidelines in the federal standards on some of those things okay. that we have to be in compliance with. Right. So the, the federal PREA standards, which came from this, require that you do screening on intake within 72 hours and then again within 30 days. So and you carry are, that out through your directives. Yes, and every time an inmate moves, it's intake. Mm -hmm. So it's done repeatedly. Mm -hmm. So there are some, for some of this, there are more uh, expansive, uh, the standards actually provide more guidance or directives really, that we would have to comply with. Where's the check and balance if they're not being complied with? Is there a check and balance? Is there a place? I mean, we can put all this down on paper and say we're doing it, but is there anything that you've come across, Eric, and we'll ask this too of DOC, where it's being done or not being done? How are we to know? Well, uh, I didn't see anything about a specific administrative process. There may well be one. Um, there's always, you know, as an attorney, I always say, well, you can always go to court. But you could. <laughs> you could, actually. Someone could bring a, a legal action, certainly saying that uh, uh, the uh, state agency is out of compliance with a federal rule. Um, but uh, short of that, th there probably is some internal way that uh, perhaps the... I know there's obviously certification. So every year, the, the state has to certify that they're in compliance. If someone else were to allege that they were not in compliance, I don't know. Is there a process for that? I'm There's not sure. a, we get audited every three years. Oh, that's a good point. Right? So, not it. Uh, sorry, but there is a, a, it's an important, and Jane can talk about this, yeah. but we, we have an external auditor. Those auditors are trained through um, the National Resource Center. They come in, they conduct extensive reviews of our paperwork and our facilities. So it's so the paperwork about that, that they look at. They, 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 interview, they, they, they interview. There's a whole guideline. They must conduct interviews. Uh, there are specific interviews. The warden, the PREA coordinator, the PREA compliance manager, um, inmates, uh, first responder staff, medical staff, mental health staff, investigative staff, commissioner. Uh, the commissioner. Um, so they audit central office as far as policies and procedures and how we handle things from the top. And then they audit each institution. Uh, and you have to do a third of your facilities each year. So, so the federal, this all came into effect in 2012? Correct. When did we become compliant with PREA? Uh, we first started our audits in 2013, 2013, because that's when they were first required. Uh, and we were certified, and then we did it again in 2017, and we were certified. And we're getting ready to do them. So we're ready now, 2020? Yeah, uh, we're about to end. Well, we're in our cycle now. Um, and. The, there was also a draft of the standards that came out in 2008, uh, and we were actually at the time working with national consultants who wrote part of the act itself as well as were on the Prison Rate Commission, and so we were already working on using those strategies and were a part of the federal scene in modifying some of the standards to make them work. Okay. Linda and then Carl, did you have anything You said Kirk. <laughs> Curl. <Curl. laughs> <laughs> so are these auditors like SOX auditors, like PCAOB oversight auditors, or just their people who you hire who are accountants who do auditing? Or no. so yeah. what are their what level? 
The Pre Resource Center, which is the national um, kind of go to for all of this, which includes the because um, the standards are constantly in flux uh, as audits occur there is a certified training that they must go to. Uh, and it was just put in place, I believe, two years ago that you had to be certified um, officially and they, they mandated the training. So these are certified auditors that have gone through one training on how to be in compliance so, with the federal But these standards. are specific trained auditors yes. to this, own, this certification versus auditors Correct. who actually Correct. are governed by an oversight board who go in and look at the internal controls well there is specifically this organization that you use certified through this organization they have a cooperative agreement with the national institute of corrections the oversight comes from doj they're priya specific audits by priya um, trained specialists the, the original audit trainings that happen were run by folks that who were on the original commission with the Moss Group, who is um, has the uh, one of the biggest cooperative agreements with NIC over the years in terms of training, as well as um, BJA staff, BJS staff, they bring in pretty much um, everyone that has their hands or responsibility or leverage into those pre audit trainings because it covers everything from cameras to policy to accountability, prevention, education. So they're a very big deal. You have to apply to get in. It's very hard to pass. And then uh, the bidding process is also really aggressive. So they have to bid on these contracts. And the PREA audit auditors are audited. Who oversees that? I think that's DOJ mm -hmm. on the audits. Okay. Thank you. Kurt? I think that answered my question. I'm good. <laughs> I just pulled up some of the audit language from the summary. See, okay. the third, the third column on the right there, the sort of an italicized audits paragraph, and that talks about some of what was just being discussed about some of the standards that apply to the auditors, but that they conducted by a member of a correctional monitoring bo bo correctional monitoring body that is not part of the uh, or under the authority of the agency. Um, you see that last paragraph, the department, that, that means Department of Justice, and I think you were just referring to this. They have to develop and issue an audit instrument, and all auditors must be certified by the department pursuant to procedures, uh, including training requirements to be issued subsequently. So I assume that those requirements have, been since, have since been issued. I want to read that number one. A member of a correctional monitoring body that is not part of or under the authority of the agency, which is the federal agency, <coughs> correct? <clears throat> no, I think or that's the, local. the I think that's the local. So it is not under the authority of DOC or the Agency of Human Services in this part. D either one. Uh, yeah, I would read it that way since DOC be, is within AHS. Okay. Right? But in parentheses, but may be part of or authorized by the relevant state or local government. So someone could be part of DOC or could be part of the agency. No, I think no, a different no. part. I think a that means that, like, say you had a, a separate branch of state government. Maybe you had an auditor department or something like that, um, but not yeah. within AFS or DAS. It can't be part of that agency, I think. Okay, but you don't want the fox guard in the hen house. It's been changed right. in application. It, originally, when this came out, the intent was to be able to have, so for example, yeah, Woodside has, um, they have to be audited as well, the juvenile facilities mm -hmm. do, so DCF does. So originally, the thought was that you could have somebody from DCF audit DOC and somebody from DOC audit DCF. This was when the all of the state's PREA coordinators were working with the PREA Resource Center and then everyone realized that was not a good idea because nobody, it's not time, it's not, it's not a good practice. And so that isn't done. So we hire out. We, we've never used anyone that's connected with any department or agency in, in the state. So that hiring out piece, is that in one of your directives, or is it just common practice for DOC? The regular bidding process. Yeah. But it's just common practice. It's not, um, it's not something that you must do, but it's something you it's do. It's done do. as part of this, to comply with the standards and the law. The so law. It, that, that comes through. Yeah. But you still have a little seems like you still have a little wiggle room uh, with the uh, language that's it's in the federal rule, uh, as Alice just read, uh, but maybe part of or authorized by a relevant state or local government. So yeah, you, you and your 
wisdom uh, have decided that that's not a great idea. No, the Priya Resource Center has actually provided guidance on some of the rule language that has um, been more specific, and so it would not be allowed under their guidance for the. Um, they have a page called FAQs or Frequently Asked Questions, and that's where they provide the guidance. And that's done through the um, prison, uh, the PREA management office. So that's where that language comes from. So there's what it says, and then there's what we're allowed to do. Oh, we'll talk about it later. This, uh, this is the first time we've ever had a real in-depth testimony on PREA. It's sort of always been out there. So there's a lot of information we have to uh, process. So we're going to be looking at this for a while. Yes, my hunch. There's a lot of information there. That's yeah. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> Not have the advantage of brevity. Yes, yeah, Sarah. Um, hang on, Eric. Eric, okay. I just have a question. Are there states um, that you know of? This is probably something you may or may not know but that would extend this law to anybody who is for DOC employees or staff to, have, to be prohibited from contact with formerly incarcerated folks? I mean, is there anything like that? I don't know if anything like that exists, but it, certainly it's within a state's independent authority to, to go beyond what Priya says and to, or to enact different standards for the interactions between mm -hmm folks from those groups that you just mentioned. So I don't know whether it's been done, but it certainly could be. I'm just reading that second call. <laughs> you know, discipline. And I'm going down to the second paragraph, and then it goes into medical and mental health. And I'm just kind of wondering how this has all been played out within our facilities over time. Right. That is on my uh, list. I'll go we'll get to that okay. shortly. But uh, um, okay. I'm ahead of you. Sorry. That's okay. That's okay. It's all. It's funny with Sorry. three columns. It's easy to get ahead like that. <laughs> um, but we just talked about screening, right? We were, that's kind of where we were at, and then we got into the auditing a little bit. Now, there are a couple other big points I wanted to make, and one I think is did I talk about response planning and no. investigations? No. no. Cross under. Hmm. Not seeing this next one. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, actually, I'm looking more for the searches. The cross gender searches and viewing of that somewhere? Uh, is it under responsive language? The ballistics. Yeah. Yeah. It's my investigation. Agreed. Yeah. Huh. Odd. Well, anyway. Uh, Right, yeah, that's what I thought it was. The first what are you the, looking for, Eric? Well, I'll just mention it. Oh, first. There's, there um, should be a topic that is uh, yes, cross-gender searches yes, and viewing. Yeah, I saw that earlier. Yeah, yeah, it's, 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 it's on page five, five yeah. of this. Um, the right In the third column. Third on this page, it's near the line. audits or above it? A little bit. Yeah, keep going. Down? Down. Oh. Well, see, that's Medical the, uh, and mental health? Yeah. No, so, on the right hand side. So the right hand call. Oh, yeah, lesbian, lesbian gay, gay, bisexual, yeah. transgender. Yeah. Way on the right. Mm -hmm. Right. So another, the there's another cross gender searching. That's the one I'm looking for. I know I got mixed up by those two. For, yeah. That's what I thought yeah, it was. That's actually on page four. It's Is on it? page four? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. One above. Oh, there. I see. There it yep, is. there you go. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Top right hand, third column on the top right. There so this go. is a very specific, and they were mentioning earlier, some of these rules get more specific than others, and this is quite specific. And uh, the standards basically have a ban on cross-gender pat-down searches of female inmates in adult prisons, absent exigent circumstances. So, but the rule is different for juvenile facilities. Juvenile facilities, cross-gender pat-down searches prohibited for both female and male residents. So, got a difference there. And uh, depending on whether it's a juvenile or an adult facility. So in our male facility, we could have a female correctional officer do a pat down of a male inmate. Unless it has to be in exigent circumstances. So the general says the pat down searches are prohibited unless there's exigent circumstances, which means generally some kind of emergency time sensitive situation. Yeah, but if you have. This only pertains oh, I'm sorry. to you female were... inmates. Exactly. So in a male facility yes. right. with a female correctional officer, a female correctional officer could do a pat-down of a male inmate. Yes. Because that 
I mean, we have female correctional officers in male facilities. Yeah. And there's also a difference between, as you see, a difference between a pat-down search and a strip search, search or a cavity search. So those are also different. Those are right. prohibited. Cross-gender strip searches and visual cavity searches are prohibited generally. Not, doesn't, not based on whether it's an adult facility or juvenile facility or whether it's based on the gender of the person doing the searching. Again, absent exigent circumstances. So if you've got some kind of emergency time-sensitive situation. But in those cases, for, as far as the strip searches and the cavity searches, there's some specificity, specificity excuse me, and they have to be performed by medical practitioners and they have to be documented. So it's interesting that it's, compared to some of the other rules, that one's a pretty high level of detail. Um, all right, so reporting would be uh, the next one that I have down here. And ba basically, um, this when I say reporting, I don't mean um, you know the state reporting about the number of incidents in a given year. I'm referring to reporting after an incident has occurred and how the victim might might actually uh, make a report of what has happened. That sort of reporting. And what the rule says is that the, the agencies have to provide at least two internal reporting avenues. So there's different ways for the victim to make a report. And the rule interestingly says that at least one way to report uh, the abuse to a public or private entity or office that is not part of the agency. So that's the ability to make a report that is outside the agency and that can allow inmates to re remain anonymous. So there has to be a way, there are two internal reporting avenues, plus another way to report externally um, to someone outside the agency that allows the person to remain anonymous. Sarah, well, did you have a question? No. Well, they can report it, but, they're re but if they're reporting it, if it's not external, and they're reporting it internal, where is there a review that that report has been acted on? Yeah, I think there, the, what, the, what the has to be done in response to the report will also come up <clears throat> next. Um, but one last point about reporting, a couple last points. Uh, there also has to be a way for third parties to report on behalf of somebody else. So there has to be something maintained that allows somebody to report on behalf of a victim. Maybe the victim doesn't want to report. So that herself. third party could be a family member? Could be an advocate group? Uh, that's an interesting well, question. I would think so. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think it's limited to who it might be, right? So that gets to something we've been grappling with, just so the committee can kind of process this as we proceed along, trying to find the facts and trying to find what's in place. Um, one thing that Butch and I have said, and Butch mentioned this yesterday, with the article that came out, it covers a span of about eight to ten years. It wasn't all at once. And over that period of time, we quite often hear through the advocate groups or parents or family members of what's occurring in our facilities. And we haven't heard any of this, those, the allegations that were out there. So I'm just keep going around in my mind. What happened that we haven't heard of is the was it reported and then not acted on? Was it not reported? Did, did other folks that knew about it didn't report it? <laughs> you know, it just doesn't connect because in our world here as legislators, I'm sure many of you have gotten calls from constituents or parents mm -hmm. or family members and saying, my son or my daughter, they're not getting services and corrections, they're failing. We hear about this. And that's where we come up like, why haven't we heard about this? Has it gone underground so much for a particular reason, whatever that reason is? I don't know. I don't know. The, the things that have happened previously were reported in newspapers, weren't they? Not necessarily. No, we're talking about wait until this way back. Okay. Yeah, the, like the article, there were no articles 10 years ago about these things? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I get letters all the time yeah. from inmates. And you know, one that came in from Mississippi 
Monday before I left. I haven't opened it yet. <laughs> um, Christmas card. Yeah. <laughs> the center of Sears gets them all the time. We all get something. Yeah. They come into our office sometimes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, that's what we're trying price, to but. grapple. Is this an undercurrent that's happening? <clears throat> Underground that's happening? Is it being, you know, we don't know. And that's what we're trying to, to get to. And in order to get to that, we need to know, and this is why we're going through this, we need to know what's in place in statute, in rules, and directives, and how that chain of command, I hate to use that term, but how it works up through the system so we can find out where the break occurred, if there was a break. Okay. Linda and then Butch. Just on the auditing process, I just want to go back there. I just read through that 90-page requirement. Oh, good. He's a speaker. He's a speaker. So, what type of audit reports have been issued? There's a 30-day minimum that has to be a corrective action. Like, are they, if the corrective action is done within the 180 days, what's done? What is the process? And what kind of reports has everybody received and are they public? Yeah. Would you like us to answer that? Like yeah, that would be wonderful. Thank you. I, I can start and then you want to pick up. So the, the, that 180 day window for corrective action is an opportunity to fix mistakes. Sometimes there's small mistakes where we may have missed something or we are doing what we need to be doing, but it didn't get covered. The, um, the end of the audit cycle, which is um, was, it's one third of the facilities is full. So we're doing a couple, so we, we're starting in February and we'll do two this year. Um, just, just to lead, the, uh, Vermont was one of the first states in the country to pass all the audits. And I don't know that you were going to cover that, but um, that's indeed important. But the corrective action period is a window where um, we can make changes or show proof of documentation where it may, maybe it slipped through the cracks in terms of what was at the facility. Um, sometimes um, it's a way to um, take a look at a directive or a policy that might be missing a component and Jen's going to talk about that when she speaks to the rest of it but they I, we haven't gotten to the part where we haven't passed an audit or had to um, weren't able to provide the governor's assurance the other piece of that too is Can I we, just, yeah. so the auditor issues a report and there's three levels it's not a pass or fail it's you meet the standards and so on and so on mm -hmm. and that's how the report comes out if it's not a pass or fail and Priya pretty much established the fact that the auditor is going in there with the understanding that there's not going to be able to meet all of the standards mm -hmm. and so that's where the auditor comes in and you have that window so what type of report do the auditors actually issue is my first question and then uh, where are those reports that so we could see them? Go ahead. Um, we can get you the reports as far as uh, if you don't meet a standard, then you don't pass. Um, and so uh, it, as far as we have to, every year we have to go to the governor and we have to say this is what we've done to be in compliance, whether you are being audited or not. So we would not be able to say that we were in compliance if we weren't, if we were, if we had failed or if we didn't meet a standard. So if we are working on addressing a, a, a not met standard, during our remediation period, then we would be in compliance. But if we didn't meet the standard at the end of the mediation remediation period, we would then not be in compliance. So we would have to say to the governor, we did not, we were not in compliance, and then we're at the the risk at that point of the governor would say we're not in compliance, and we would lose the the five percent of the grants would be set aside to fix the issues that we did not address. So regardless of of what the perception is we would have to report to the governor we were not in compliance and then in that assurance letter they would say that we are not in compliance. So we get a report from the auditor. Thank for, you. Yeah. Thank you. Butch and then Sarah and then Marcia. <laughs> you had your hand up. I did. So for, oh, sorry. for, for, for oh, did you send them? No, yeah. I'm mean, sorry. Yeah, 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 she said, oh, I'm done. So yesterday we received uh, Secretary Smith's uh, memorandum concerning the whole, all the issues around uh, what we're talking about today. And one of the things that, uh, that was highlighted in his report was a, a hotline for uh, employees to report for the, uh, 
to an outside agency and DOC. But as I'm seeing here in the reporting standards by and CREA standards that the inmates have to have that also. They have to have a hotline that, that goes somewhere outside of your agency. And then and, and I'm looking at uh, rereading his, his uh, reading on on page four of his report, uh, it's, it sounds like for the interim, uh, DOC is working to enter agreement with someone to provide an additional cri crisis support line for su sur survivors. Am I making a correct, incorrect assumption that that hotline, as required by PREA, is not currently in place, where, where, where an inmate can call outside of DOC? Is that a well, yeah. Um, so the PREA standards. Yeah, I'm wondering if you folks should just introduce yourself, yeah. oh, yeah. because we're taping yeah. this and yeah. they're not going to yeah. see your yeah. face. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> sure, that sounds good. I'll start. Uh, I'm Monica Weaver. I'm the Administrative Services Director for the Department of Corrections. Jen Sprathke, the Prison Rape Elimination Act Director. Heather Simons, Director of Training and Professional Development. <laughs> um, so the standards require an outside mechanism, not specifically a hotline. Um, the hotline that was referred to uh, was originally part of the Marks McLaughlin report that was originally uh, supervised by the Agency of Human Services. And that was way back in the early 2000s. Way, way back. Um, so uh, we were using that hotline at one point um, as a mechanism that did meet the standard of it being confidential. Um, once it started being answered by the department when the agency um, stopped answering it, that is not a mechanism that we've used to meet that standard. Um, so all inmates are provided with brochures uh, in which they have addresses uh, for local advocacy groups um, so they could write to their community or the advocacy group where the facility is. Um, and we have a directive that mail that goes out to uh, any advocate is not to be read and it's to be treated as legal mail. So therefore it is not connected back to the inmate. So we would have no way of knowing what they wrote, so it would therefore be confidential. So, so you're depending on the inmates writing a note to an advocacy group? Um, uh, that's that's one adding, method. Uh, uh, that's yeah. one method. Another mm -hmm. is that uh, we have another hotline that's set up with an email address, um, so family members can reach out. That one is connected. Um, there's one that's connected to Priya, so there's an email address that's on our website, a phone number that goes, uh, both of those go to Heather and myself. Um, and then there's also the commissioner's hotline, uh, where the commissioner's admin answers yeah, but that, that doesn't that the commissioner's hotline or a hotline to you folks doesn't doesn't answer this this, no. this uh, uh, reporting requirement that uh, it can, outside the agency. It can if the individual that calls, um, the individual that calls can call on behalf of an inmate, uh, and they don't have to give their name. Um, well, we ask them when they call if they want to remain confidential. We don't we don't care who they are <laughs> if they call and say. You know, so and so is being sexually assaulted. Then we take the information for the case. So, Pre has determined that has Pre determined that the steps you've taken for this this reporting piece is adequate. Yes, they have. Three years ago. Three years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, Sarah and then Felicia. Mm -hmm. um, which kind of asked my question because I had the same question of how the DOC, given what we heard from Secretary Smith and. Um, his update mm -hmm. yesterday and uh, about this reporting. I, you know, I'm part of the Women's Caucus and we went to the Chittenden facility and we did hear from the women that, I, and I know that there's complexity with how um, how complaints are handled. They're not always made public. The people making the complaints don't always hear what the process is. I, I, I understand that dynamic, but I don't understand how um, our C Department of Corrections can pass um, an audit with the um, with this kind of lack of access to an outside entity, it seems to me completely inadequate that um, giving inmates a brochure for them to call an advocate that doesn't have standing within state government, like oh, specifically or an outside group, is not um, a solution. So I'm just. Yeah. I do, uh, it just in um, recognition of what uh, Chair Emmons said earlier, uh, Chittenden is a unique facility in that they actually have advocates in-house. Um, so uh, the women at Chittenden have a very unique opportunity that the men do not have in that they have staff in the building um, during the daylight hours, uh, well, in evening. They do uh, groups in, in the evening through divas. Um, so they have the access to advocates on site as long as they're in the through building. Through divas? Through Divas, yes. So could you explain what Oh, Diva? yeah. Divas is a, a program that's offered to the women for domestic and sexual violence 
support um, and they're um, statewide advocates so therefore they um, the contract with them through the agency they are the only employees under the agency of human services that are not required to report sexual <coughs> abuse because um, obviously the PREA standards are very clear that all employees must, uh, so we had to give them special permission through the agency to not report uh, because they are protected by the statewide advocate law. Uh, so Chittenden actually has those advocates in-house uh, and they work for the network uh, under Karen Tronsgaard Scott. Um, so we have a contract with them and the contract absolves them of having to report. So they actually have in-house um, so what, can you talk, walk us through a process of uh, one of the DUs and the advocates <coughs> are working with an inmate? I mean, what is, where does that go? How does it get processed and where is the due process? It would, that is up to the advocate. I mean, that's, so if a person, um, so if we had an incident of sexual assault in the facility, we would refer them uh, to DIVAs um, as a matter of protocol. Um, there also is, um, within the organization, um, we also work with um, HopeWorks as well. So um, DIVAs would connect with HopeWorks to figure out whether an external advocate is better than internal, um, because in some cases they might not want to talk to someone in the facility. Uh, and since they are advocates, there's a protection in their communication. Um, so we would uh, refer them, and then DIVAs would provide whatever services they provide. We don't ask for any information because then it wouldn't be confidential so if we send them to a group or if they go meet with them individually then they would go do that but there's no necessarily anything that goes towards an employee's one of the employee's supervisors or or a, it can't a unless result. it can't unless the advocate if if so if an inmate went to the advocate and reported an incident they would have to allow the advocate to report it to us so they'd have to give permission yes because the advocate is not a required Correct. reporter. Correct. And that is the, the heart of the standard is to allow, I mean, the reality is it's, I mean, if you if you look at the four, punishment is the last one on purpose because the reality is you're in a confinement setting where you don't have yeah, control. control. And it's about safety. And it's about people feeling as safe as they can in a controlled and confined environment. So what we have to know is that there are going to be inmates that are not going to want to come forward because it's vulnerable. <coughs> Uh, especially if you're talking about men. If they admit to being sexually assaulted, then they are at risk of being sexually assaulted more so. Um, so this is about providing them an advocate to get help, not to report, um, because their well-being is what's most important. If they want to report it, they can. Same thing goes for a SANE. If somebody has reports being sexually assaulted, we send them out to be seen by a sexual assault nurse examiner. They don't have to pursue charges. That's up to them. And we tell them that, whether you wish to work with VSP or not, um, that's up to you. But the point of going to be seen by a sexual assault nurse examiner is to get um, options of medical care and post-exposure prophylaxis because we want them to, this is a health safety issue, because we know that the folks in our system are more likely to have sexually transmitted infections. Um, and we want them to receive medical care. And if they go um, be seen by a SANE, then that evidence will be collected. And when they get released, they can then pursue charges. If they don't go be seen by a SANE, then that evidence won't be there and then it's no longer an option. Because they might not want to pursue charges in there because they might have to face the individual for a minute or two. Um, so I know it was a very long answer to a very <laughs> short question. <laughs> so is that a nurse, a sexual assault nurse? Is that through Centurion or is that no, outside? No, that's it's the outside. hospital. That's the hospital. Correct. We call, UVM, we do not do any, yeah. well it would be any, any hospital, any local hospital. Okay, so it's out of Centurion, out of Correct. Okay. Correct. Correct. Yes. I just, it, so the men don't have access to divas the, in the men's facility? The Correct. The contract for, for divas is only for the women's facility. And is there anything comparable or to that in the men's facility? No. Thank you. Alicia and then Carl. Okay. So I have more than a couple questions, but I'm going to try and parse them out so it's specific answers. Um, how can the public access pre reports? Like, just any member of the public, rather than having you furnish it for us directly, if I'm a member of the public, if I'm a family member, how do I find a pre report? If you go to our state web page, um, the, the public one, there's a link for PREA, and all of our resources and reports are available there. I, okay. I wanted to check that before I told you to go there, and look it was great on a computer. <laughs> so okay. it is on the web page, so you can access it. So all of the audit reports are there. All of the reports that we, all the data, as Eric talked about, that we supply to the Bureau of Justice Statistics, those reports are there. Other information um, that we 
made available to inmates and to the public are all directly on our public website as a page. Okay, I know we got a lot more questions. Um, Felicia, Carl, and then Linda, yep. and then oh, I forgot about you, Marshall. <laughs> <laughs> what right after Sarah? What issues have been flagged as out of compliance that we're working on, but because we're working on them, we've been declared in compliance with PREA? So what issues? Okay, so you addressed earlier, sorry, I want to back it up just a bit, that if we are addressing an issue, PREA sees that as being in compliance, correct? Within the within doing that 180 or 90 days. Yeah, during the remediation period, yes. Yes. Um, are, what issues were flagged in our most recent report and have have they been resolved to the point that you're confident in this upcoming PREA audit that they're not going to be flagged again? Um, I, I don't want to sound like I'm not answering. The reality is I, I, you prepare for every audit and I, uh, I mean, every, between every audit, there are, there's more information that comes out. So each and every audit is more specific and better um, because we're constantly improving. And as far as I'm concerned, for the department, when we view an audit, it's not a pass-fail. We are looking at how safe are we. And I will expect to some regards that there will be standards that we haven't met because we can't know everything. Um, and right now, off the top of my head, I do not know um, all of uh, because again, it's six facilities. I don't know all of the standards that we were, uh, that we had to address in the remediation period to be able to comprehensively answer that question. I can do it, um, just not right here, right now. Okay. Um, and then I think my last point is I, I think that it is incredibly exclusionary that we have a third party reporting system based on notes because you're relying on literacy that is not there. And I just really want to make that clear that how incredibly presumptive it is that there is a standard of literacy and we are excluding our absolutely most vulnerable from reporting. And that is incredibly upsetting. So to clarify, can they report verbally or does that have to be written? Uh, they can report verbally. Um, I mean, any volunteer or contractor that comes in the building, they can report to, and then that person can bring it forward. Um, so they, prisoners' rights is another option. They can report to prisoners' rights. Um, we have posters in the units for prisoners' rights phone number, but that they're not uh, allowed through prisoners' rights to have that on their pin sheet, but they can um, write or talk to prisoners' rights when they come in, um, and we will do referrals. Uh, and it, again, what I want to be clear on is per the federal PREA standards, if a person comes forward to make a report, no matter who it is, our responsibility is to follow through with that report regardless of whether an identity is given. So if somebody comes in and says there's an inmate that's being pressured and they don't want to give the name, the report was still given and we would have to do our best to investigate it. Um, if we're able to, you know, figure out who the individual is or, you know, if they give us a date and time, we can check uh, on that. I'm going to interact with you, Carl, and go to Marshall. Yeah, no, Because I skipped yeah. over. No, that so was, I just had a Carl and fair. Linda. I just had a quick question. Uh, what two facilities are being audited now? Uh, none currently. Uh, Chittenden and Northwest will be our first facilities to be audited okay. uh, in the last week of February. Yep. Next cycle. Okay. And you said that's next February? Uh, this February. February. Yep. Okay, thank you. Uh, Carl and then Linda. I've got a, uh, just a follow-up on Representative Coffey's question, and you talked about, so someone someone comes forward and reports an assault, um, they then get whatever counseling and medical uh, attention is, is necessary or if they want. You talked a little bit about an investigation that occurs internally, even if you don't know the, even if we don't know who that is. Can you talk a little bit more about what that investigation would entail and what that looks like? Yeah, uh, we do everything we can, review video footage, review reports. Um, we will, if it's criminal in nature, uh, we will report it to VSP, um, and they will investigate uh, as well. Um, if it's a personnel-related matter, it gets referred to uh, the Department of Human Resources, uh, and then the Agency of Human Services Investigations Unit determines whether or not they will accept the case to investigate or not. Um, if they don't investigate, the PREA standards are clear, we still have to conduct an investigation. 
So then the department would have to investigate itself um, to make a determination about the staff member. Um, there may so be a problem. That's not good. It's, it's been an issue um, as far as current employees. If a person resigns during an investigation, um, then DHR says they're not an employee, they won't investigate. And the Prius standards require us to investigate, which it's very hard. The person doesn't work for us anymore. We try to interview them as best we can. It's a, it, it is very complicated, um, especially if, uh, you know, we've referred to VSP. They try to meet with the person. Um, inmate victims uh, sometimes do not view that they have been victims, um, mm -hmm. even though because of the power imbalance, we are very clear. Um, sometimes they'll report that it's they got what they needed from the individual, whether it was contraband or they were in a loving relationship. Uh, and so if they report that, then the Vermont State Police, it's not a crime. Um, so they can't pursue uh, criminal charges then. Um, so we look at everything we have. We look at the staff schedule, we look at the inmates' movement, uh, review video footage, um, interview inmates, interview staff. Um, to try and make the you know the best determination we can as to what occurred, um, and within each one of those investigations, the Prius standards require a couple of things. One, it's preponderance of evidence. So if it's likely that it occurred, then it will be considered substantiated, um, and uh, it defines that there's unsubstantiated, substantiated, un and unfounded. Unfounded is that you had you have to have proved it did not occur. Um, so an allegation like that would be an inmate says that Heather sexually assaulted me on Sunday and Heather wasn't working on Sunday. Uh, the inmate had just come in, so there's no way they got confused on the day. That would be an unfounded incident because Heather wasn't even working that day. Um, versus Heather was working that day, we're not able to get anything on video. Um, that might be an incident that would be left as unsubstantiated. Again, you know, with a lot more nuances. But So I want to interrupt here just a little bit and ask Eric a question. You said <laughs> preponderance of the evidence. Is that a lower standard than probable cause? You need more evidence for preponderance of the evidence than probable cause? Well, probable cause is, is um, when you're talking about evidentiary standards for, for burden of proof, the, the tier usually is uh, beyond a reasonable doubt, clear and convincing, and preponderance. So, so when preponderance they is lower or higher? Lowest. It's the lowest. Correct. That's all I usually mean. call it more likely than not. Sometimes you, okay. you people will say, okay. if you think of it as a percentage, it's 51-49. You sort of believe something 51% one way, just a little bit more than 49% the other, um, then that's often near to as preponderance, whereas, you know, uh, clear and convincing or beyond, you know, is more like a reasonable person could not possibly find it the, op that the opposite to be true. It's usually the standard, I just point out the preponderance, is usually the standard in civil proceedings in okay. court. So if okay. you bring a That's lawsuit helpful. against somebody. So it's a lower standard. Yeah. Don't need as much proof. Okay. Carl Lindon Butch. Thank, thanks for walking us through what that investigation would look like. Let's say the uh, the inmate wants to press charges and decides to do so. What sort of protections are afforded to that inmate? Yeah, uh, the uh, PREA standards require that we do retaliation monitoring. So as soon as an individual uh, comes forward with a report, uh, we start retaliation monitoring, uh, which is assigned to their case management officer. Um, or the caseworker uh, who meets with them uh, during regular meetings to determine just basic questions. Are you getting any pressure? Is anyone saying anything? Are you okay? Um, and um, it, the staff person would be removed from that location, uh, either assigned to a different post or potentially put on RFD, depending on the nature of the allegation. Um, uh, oh, sorry, relief from duty. I apologize. I'm sorry, we're so acronym. I apologize. Um, uh, we will move inmates um, with the intention being to move the alleged perpetrator, not the alleged victim, because that's bad business practice, um, unless the victim wants to be moved. Um, so if, you know, if it's their roommate, then we would, um, depending, again, depending on the allegation, that individual would be moved to segregation, pending the investigation, or just potentially move to another unit. Because um, it, would, it would depend on whether it's a penetrating sexual act or sexual harassment, so verbal in nature. Thank you. Linda, then Thanks. So I'm looking through just one of your reports with, on the one that you meet the standards. And um, <coughs> so I just opened up the first one I came to. The 
on this particular one, did you, uh, Northwest State Correctional Facility, did you have to go through the interim remediation process to get to the meeting of the standards? Do you remember? What date was that? This one is July 28, 2015. I don't okay, know. So the males were in there. Yes. I just want to, yeah. Yeah, because the women so were at so Sentinel. Well. So if you could, and also, uh, you know, posting wise, I guess the remediation reports are not posted. What, that status is not posted. You wait for the final PREA report to be issued. So that's the only reports that are posted, the audit final report. Correct. And it also says in here, I just want to confirm. So you use the AHS as your investigative unit. Uh, I don't know specific. It depends on what you're talking about. So whenever there's an issue, you would go for investigations. So it would be AHS that does that or the Vermont State. A, a staff case would go through both. An inmate case would just be internal or, be, or Vermont State Police. Thank you. Yep. Internal being Agency of Human Services or AHSIU if it's staff misconduct? If it's staff misconduct. Mm -hmm. Correct. Mm -hmm. AHSIU does not investigate inmate on inmate allegations. No matter what the allegation is. That would be DOC. Correct. But if it's staff, then it's CHR. It would There's be AHSIU, or if they refuse to accept the case, then the department. Okay. They would. All of the department. <coughs> so thanks, Al. So mm. this is for, for, for DOC a little bit. Uh, I, know. I know a little bit about PREA just because of my exposure on just joint justice oversight and, and those type of things. But a lot of us know nothing about PREA. Including Eric. But what I think I think I know if we're if we're pre compliant in most areas, it's a pretty good thing. Mm -hmm. So my questions, and I'm sure I can't speak for the rest of the committee, is to try to understand what's going on and learn what's going on, and maybe we can spot a weakness that is within DOC that you may not be able to see because you're in DOC or you're in AHS and maybe there are no weaknesses but we're not I'm not here to point fingers I'm just here to, to, to try to learn and we're having these investigations or whatever you want to these questions or whatever through you know through because we have to uh, because everything is now on the table so uh, we're learning and and we're not I'm not pointing fingers or don't want to point fingers and we just want to make sure that moving forward we're doing uh, the best we can uh, for our employees uh, our, our DOC customers and, and for the state and uh, we're, we're we're kind of forced in a good way to, 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 to take a look at this so don't Take a whole heck of a lot of umbrage to any questions you get or anything that I think it was saying. Now maybe Carl will have a question you want to take, <laughs> but I mean it's just just kind of a personal thing. And, and Alice kind of pointed that out yesterday to the secretary that there's going to we're going to have a lot of really hard questions because we're learning, and uh, you know there's eleven sets of eyes and ears that haven't heard a lot of this stuff before, and you guys live it every day, and. So maybe there's a maybe something maybe some little thing that we see might help. Yeah, we're not targeting right. anybody. We need, as I said yesterday, this is a really emotional issue, yeah. and it's incumbent on us as a committee, as the policy committee for the Department of Corrections, to really look at the facts and understand all the moving pieces. And I appreciate what Eric said this morning when he first started his testimony. Prayer has been on the books. I haven't really looked at it. And I think that is true for all of us. We haven't really looked at it. We've heard from over time that we're compliant. Okay, we're compliant. But we've never gotten into the nitty gritty. So it's not, as Butch said, to point fingers. It's to be a partnership here to really figure out where it's breaking down, if it is breaking down, or where there are situations that we say, ooh, like we did a little while ago. Why is DOC re you know, reviewing this? to really go forward and really look at how we deliver our correctional policies in the future. And that's where we're coming from, and I think it's incumbent on us as a committee to provide that leadership. And in order to provide that leadership, 
we need to understand what's in place. And that's going to take more digging. And I don't want to mean the word digging to point fingers at anybody. It's to understand. And let me tell you, just hearing what we're hearing today, I'm sitting here thinking, oh my God, we're going to have to include Judiciary Committee to help us on some of this because there's a lot of legal implications or other parts of statute in the criminal justice system that we don't work with that we're going to need to bring to the table here. So this is not to point fingers, as Butch says. It's not to put anybody on the hot spot. It's to work as a team to figure out how we can do it better as a state. Kurt? I'm trying to get some sense of how uh, busy you are, in the sense of do, are, are there ongoing investigations now? Do you have 20? Do you have two? Do you have 100 that you're now <coughs> incidents that you're looking into? Or how frequent are these things? Just, it's a, if it's okay, can I just can I respond to the, the comments from earlier? From us too? Yes, please. <laughs> yes. And, then, and then hand it yeah. over. Sure. Um, we are very grateful that you said that because a lot of the questions that you're asking are concerns that we've had. And um, what's important to um, the three of us, particularly, um, I'm not saying it's not important to Monica, but Jen and I have been working on this for over a decade. And what we have is a unique perspective on what the challenges were in the last 10 years, where we uh, were pushing up against either uh, marketing issues, because Priya wasn't always popular, it's very trendy now, but certainly trying to sell it um, back in the early 2000s. We, uh, um, there were some challenges within our own administration in terms of the value of pushing a culture where we are now saying out loud that prison rape is not part of your sentence. And this is a national challenge that was very difficult. So there are people within our department that are still work that are still with us, including the two of us, that want you to know what that historical story was because it's going to help flesh out where some of the pain points have been. Um, it's not not just settling um, <coughs> the directives, but things like literally working in the affective realm where convincing folks that this actually matters with a population that's not usually paid attention to. Um, there is a story behind hotlines and reporting that we would like you to know if you're interested because that wasn't easy for us to get even what we have. You won't find that we are defending anything that we're doing, but more, more thanking you for asking some questions with regards to the challenges around how all of these tentacles go out and the various places that they touch. And we cannot pass an, the audits, audits the paperwork, audits the checks and balances with our staff. The audit is the pop quiz that the auditor um, delivers when they walk down the hallway of a facility and ask a staff person, do you understand what PREA is? Tell me what you think sexual safety is for an inmate. Tell me if you know how to report. Asking a transitioning superintendent they have to go through an interview. If they're a new superintendent, you know, in terms of like the questions around 180 corrective action, if they've only been there for six weeks, they may not know all of PREA. Those are the, the sort of the lower level um, challenges that might happen in a corrective action period. But really, the um, Jen Spravke knows every single standard, every single one, in and out. We know where um, we've fallen down in investigations in terms of transparency or being in the, wanting to be in the right meetings where we can connect the dots with staff sexual misconduct and preventive measures around training. Um, neither of us or our uh, current commissioner, or past commissioner, incoming commissioner is going to try to defend ourselves in terms of what we're doing, but really we want you to know the story about how complicated this is because as a state we all have to be in this. State's attorneys need to buy in in order for us to prosecute criminal charges with uh, staff that are uh, committing felony sexual assault. We can't do this without judges. We can't do this without the education components with our partners and victims. Um, the advocacy groups have been working with us for a long time, but believe it or not, that was a sell for us too. These are folks, the folks that are incarcerated, have victims, and so sometimes it's, it's it's difficult to support the person who hurt the person you're working with in the community. 
I won't go on for too much longer other than um, to say again thank you for making those points about pointing fingers because we really have a story that's important and rich and substantive and we want you to know it so we welcome all the questions and I appreciate what you just said <clears throat> and I think one thing that really stands out for me is prison rape should not be part of your sentence Indeed. and I think what people visualize or think is an officer on an inmate, but it's also inmate on inmate. Mm -hmm. It's all That's over. right. And it could be vice versa, mm -hmm. inmate vice on versa. officer. And it's women on men, and we forget that as well, that in our minds it's male officers With and female, female victims, victims. Right. and the data, the data does not show that. Yeah. Women professionals, we're holding our own and pulling our weight in terms of allegations and substantiated cases, and it's not just officers. It's contractors, it's clinicians, it's doctors, it's everybody. There is not one profession that is not in the mix of the discussion of perpetrating and committing these acts. And that, again, shows what we see in our world, our <laughs> civil world, not our corrections world. Everything that we see and hear about and the outside is occurring within these facilities and it's behind closed doors. So we don't think it's happening. But everything that we experience <coughs> in our news cycle and our experience is happening in the corrections and people don't want to acknowledge that. Mm -hmm. And there's a misconception within it. I mean, to, to drive Heather's point, we had a, a, a staff member, a female staff member at uh, the Windsor facility, this was in the news, so it's, I'm not sharing anything that's uh, not public, who engaged in misconduct with a male inmate. Um, she was impregnated. Um, the DNA test confirmed that it was her baby, obviously, and his, um, and she was working at the time, and the state's attorney did not charge her with staff sexual exploitation, which is the statute that um, Eric referred to earlier. Instead, she was charged with lewd and lascivious behavior. She was given a year probation, and all she had to do was go to counseling services, um, and then her record would be cleared. Um, and that's out of DOC's hands. That's out of our hands. But you get the blame for it. Well, not, you know, the blame is one thing. We're used to that. That's in the news. Um, my role at the time was I then have to work with a staff in that building who did the hard thing. It is hard to report your colleague not because you want to protect them, but because you are each other's protection. When an, when an mm -hmm. incident occurs, it's you have to true. count on when Heather's coming, she's got my back. She's going to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. And if she's willing to do that, engage in sex with an inmate, she's not willing to do the right thing. So it then comes into question where you have to wonder um, what's going on. And then when you see the world, you did the right thing. You reported your colleague because you said that is not OK. And then to, I'm not crying by the way, it's just because I'm sick. So <laughs> I could get that emotional, but, that but I am that yeah, passionate. You are that passionate. Um, yeah. 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 I know. Um, yeah. that, they're, that they're saying, and then what do I get? Because the world said she was the victim because he pursued her. That was what made the paper. That was what showed in the conviction. And they're, they're left with that. And, that. and then what does that say for the offenders as well, as far as their value and their worth? So let's get back to Kurt's question. How busy have you been? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you, you, yes, yeah, I'm sorry you asked that question. No, that's fine. <laughs> it's great. I mean, it's fine. So um, we just um, reported on the 2018 data for the Bureau of Justice and Statistics, and I have to admit I do not know all of that, but it is on the website. Um, it is posted on that uh, website as far as how many incidents occurred. Um, and uh, within a week, again, it depends on the week, um, but we can have 20 allegations come forward. That does not mean, oh, yeah, that does not mean that they are all sexual abuse. Um, and, it, you know, you might have an inmate that calls the hotline and says, I was sexually harassed, and then when the allegation comes forward, it's that the officer was looking at them, and they had written them a DR, and so they thought they were looking at them funny. 
Mm -hmm. um, and so that's a sorry disciplinary report. Um, and so that would not be tracked under sexual victimization because the federal PREA standards give us very specific language on what meets the standard. Um, but Vermont is also very unique uh, in that because we've been doing this work for a long time, um, we actually uh, started tracking low-level sexualized behavior. Uh, so, for example, pantsing or pulling someone's pants down. Um, uh, um, it might be uh, making a comment that doesn't quite reach to the level of sexual harassment, but you know it's on the gateway. Uh, we train that in our advanced communication techniques at the academy so that staff know how to address it. Same thing with masturbation. How do you respond to that? Masturbation is a, a fantastic example in our advanced communication techniques because it's different levels. If somebody's under their covers, is that harassment? No. You don't actually know what they're doing, and they're doing the best that they can to keep it private. If they're sitting in a chair in front of the cell door doing it for your benefit, that's a different story. That's an incident that would not be covered under the federal PREA standards, but it matters if that's your roommate. Uh, and so we address those low-level behaviors, and we spent a lot of time training staff, because in the world, pantsing is considered horseplay, pulling someone's pants down. It's not. It's an assault in a correctional facility. You put your hands on someone that you aren't allowed to do that with. So that's a culture shift to get folks to understand that. Um, and so some of those things are, those are all tracked and identified as well. Um, and from my shop, I work with the PREA coordinators at all the facilities, they track that behavior as well. So you're responding to coincidence that you have to respond to. Yes. Maybe. And you said, 10 or 20 a week or something Could is be. not, okay. That, okay. That's not uncommon, but when you, at the end of that week or in a month, yeah. when you when you kind of whittle those all down, you might have five that were sexualized behavior. Okay. You might have one or two that yeah, were I'm just trying to get a feel violence. of, yes. of this is something that happens once a month or once every They're six weeks. They're not bored. Or, yeah, okay. Um, and it's because there's a lot of behavior and you have to, you have to look into it to figure out what it is. Yeah. Plus there's also, the retaliation monitoring, mm -hmm. ensuring that the um, screening tools are being done, ensuring that your referrals are done, uh, following up with the investigators to make sure that they've met their part, uh, keeping track of discipline to ensure that that was uh, delivered, if that was the case. Um, so there's a lot of um, requirements as well as uh, there's a lot to do. And training mm -hmm. is a huge part. There, one, I'd like to make one comment. Because I've, I may know, I'm, I'm visit prisons regularly in my they spare time. Kept yeah. them, yeah. So, but I also, in, in preparation for that or in response to it or for putting together the thing which we're going to talk about this afternoon, we uh, I often go to other states' websites and try to find, you know, can I get pictures of the place? Can I find out what they are? And Vermont's is incredibly transparent. It's very, it's easy to, it's a lot easier to find things in Vermont, on all of Vermont's state websites than it is in most of the other states that I try to do research on. So I, it, I'm always surprised at how easy it is to get information, just as a comment. That's very positive. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm looking at a couple of the most recent pre-reports. Um, the one I have open is for the Chittenden facility. Um, and just so I can understand it properly when I'm going through it, I don't have any specific questions right now. When it lists the standards that you did not meet as five, and then two lines down, it only lists three sections that were not met standards. Mm -hmm. And then in the, the actual text of the report, it's listing them as met. How, how much is this updated based on the remediation that was completed in 2017. <laughs> I know what you're looking at. Yeah. Yeah. You know, okay. It would really help if we could actually put that thing yeah, on the website. Yeah, so I'm, I'm thinking, you know, I'm looking at the time, and we're going to get more in depth, and, and you'll have to come back. We're going to schedule more time, but it might be good <laughs> to schedule time that we look specifically at some of those previous reports and go through them as a whole committee. Yeah, because I just wanted, Linda's been looking at it, other folks have been looking at it, and we haven't even gone through what Eric <laughs> has to go through with the federal rules yet, which is really important. So it's not to negate what you're talking about, but I think what we need to do is schedule a time sure. 
next week. Next week, Friday morning, something to go through specifically what we have here for the audits that have been done in the reports so that we all can see it. Does that make sense to the committee? Yeah, I think it was just a little difficult to understand having pulled it up and wanting to trust the audit and then immediately seeing discrepancies. I really want that's, to understand why that's, that's there before I kind of start to take issues with the audit. Right, if, if and we need to understand sense. that yeah. as a whole committee. And you folks need to see what committee members are referring to when they're talking about specific report. So let's put that on our agenda. For We've got time Friday morning, possibly, um, depending on their schedule. And then we have time next week. So we'll figure that out for that. Does that make sense for folks? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Eric, why don't you continue <laughs> for a little bit here? You know, there isn't, uh, you were just mentioning this, but the, sort of the way this conversation has gone for the last 15 or 20 minutes or so, you know, you kind of have by the nature of the topics that you kind of brought into the discussion, there's not a heck of a lot left that I have to offer. Because um, you, you went through sort of the investigatory process through uh, with the planning response. We didn't talk much about discipline. That's only the last couple of things of these to discipline and medical mental health care. I mean, I, I could mention those couple of things just so you sort of have a big picture understanding of at least what the standard and the rule said about discipline. This means employee discipline or discipline of somebody who's actually committed uh, sexual abuse, but the general language of the standard is that um, the staff, they have to be subject to discipline for violating agency policies regarding sexual abuse, and it's interesting that termination is the presumptive discipline for engaging in sexual abuse. Now that doesn't mean it's required, but it's presumptive. That means there's a presumption uh, that could be rebutted, that's sort of the legal term, but the presumption can be rebutted by contrary evidence. So, presumption is someone commits, that person commits sexual abuse, they're going to be terminated. But if there's contrary evidence, you can overcome the presumption. Um, maybe there's extenuating circumstances. There might have been other sort of facts that weren't, uh, that could be developed or that would, that would suggest that termination wasn't the right response. But it is the presumptive response, essentially, at least in the standard. Also, if there's a termination or a resignation, I think this kind of got at earlier as well, for violating the sexual abuse policies, it's supposed to be reported to law enforcement, unless the conduct was clearly not criminal. Not sure how that would be, but I think that's what the standard said. <laughs> um, and to relevant licensing bodies as well, if there's any. Um, another point about the discipline that I pulled out of the rule was that uh, um, Inmates can be subject to disciplinary action for committing sexual abuse as well. However, it's interesting that, that uh, I think, and correct if I'm wrong on this, if I was reading this correctly, the inmate can be disciplined only where the staff member did not consent. Is that right? So we don't need, we don't, that's other states. Oh, really? Right, right. Yeah, if there's sex that. between staff and inmates, we, it's clear. Oh, that's there's true. no right, such right. thing as consent. Gotcha. So that's not enough thing. Sure. Right. Uh, last couple of points to make then would be uh, on the LGBTI, uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, intersex, gender nonconforming inmates. There's some specificity with respect to the standards on that issue as well. It requires training in effective and professional communication with LGBTI and gender nonconforming inmates. And this is interesting, this is uh, about the reviews after an incident happens. The post-incident post review has to consider whether the incident might have been motivated by LGBTI identification status for particular <coughs> status. That's something that has to go into the uh, post-incident review process. And lastly, just medical and mental health care facilities have to provide timely, unimpeded access to emergency medical treatment and crisis intervention services. And then there's more detail uh, that uh, I'm sure folks from DOC will be able to talk about, but that was the big picture point that I wanted to at least make for the committee. And the audits was the last thing, which I think we spent quite a bit of time talking about already. Uh, uh, one thing, if I, if oh, I can sorry, add ahead, to the please. medical piece, well, part of the reason why that's there is in other states, when inmates would be transported to the hospital, they were forced to pay for their uh, the exam with the sexual assault nurse examiner. We have never done that. But before we were even complying with standards, uh, we would not have uh, required that. And um, as far as, um, to your point, Mr. Taylor, the, uh, we have actually had, um, I would say if, if you took a year, um, at least one incident a month at Chittenden where someone has come in from the streets 
uh, reporting being a victim of sexual assault that we have, um, that either has seen a same before they come <coughs> with the sheriffs or VSP, or that we have been transported to the hospital to be seen. We, tra we treat those folks as well, even though it has nothing to do with an incident occurring at the institution. You use that uh, as a A sexual again. assault nurse examiner. So ah, they're okay. the, the statewide certified um, examiners at each hospital that are certified to perform a sexual assault exam. So we would provide services to someone coming in, even if they're uh, incapacitated or uh, they're, you know, a detainee that's going to court. If they report it when they come in, we'll send them out. Okay. So it's someone who comes in prior to being arraigned. Right? Correct. We would send them to the hospital because you don't get in the way of that. Yeah, you know. So those would be tracked as well. They wouldn't be reported to the federal <coughs> government, but we would track them. And some other states won't even do that. No. no. Correct. You know, I wish for folks who are sometimes so critical about corrections in our state, and this is broad for many people, are critical. We've done a lot of work over the years in our corrections policy. We're way ahead of other states, and as Kurt just said, even our website is much more transparent. I wish that people could really put that in perspective and give credit to where credit is due and acknowledge that, you know, considering corrections, we really have a department or agency, human services, that's really in the forefront and way ahead of other states. It may not be, it, I mean, there are issues, not to deny there are not issues in our DOC uh, world, but I think we are way ahead in comparison with other states. And I think folks need to pat ourselves and DOC on the back. Mm -hmm. For that, and not always be so critical of point fingers. We, I mean, one great example of that is our policy on condoms. We've had a, a directive and policy on condoms since the late 80s um, to address the HIV AIDS epidemic, where inmates can request through medical to have a condom. Because there's what's against the rules, and then there's human behavior. Um, and uh, if they request it for medical, medical does not have to report it, it's considered part of medical care. Um, so that a person can be in charge of their own safety. And I know when I went um, to uh, training with all of the federal PREA coordinators, that came up and Morris Thickpen from the National Institute of Corrections turned around in his chair and said, you do what? Uh, and he said, how do you align that with PREA? Because if, if the Prison Rape Elimination Act says there's no such thing as consent, how is that okay? And we said, we don't treat it as consensual, but if a person's going to be forced and this is the ability for them to not contract a sexually transmitted infection, it's our responsibility to give them something they can use. As soon as we have reason to believe there's something going on, then we'll report it and we'll investigate it. But people need to have secure measures as best as they can. <coughs> Did you have anything else, Eric? Nope. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, follow up. We're going to take a break and move on to an easier topic. Um, and, Eric, I'm going to ask you for some help for our committee in terms of we're getting also into other areas of judicial criminal justice. Are you seeing that as well? I mean, that's what I'm feeling. Is that from what we've been hearing from DOC and you know, it goes to HR, goes to uh, state police, it can involve some state's attorneys not prosecuting. <clears throat> Should we reach out to Judiciary Committee, to you folks, for more help on this? I think as the, as the maybe note the specifics as they come along, whatever particular items you think would be helpful to have me or someone else from our team come in and help out with, we're, we're happy to do that. Um, I think as you know better than anybody, there's always been some crossover between mm -hmm. these committees, right, and the subject matter of what, what you deal with. And uh, um, so maybe it kind of ebbs and flows a little bit, maybe more so with some issues than others. But, uh, but at least as far as this act so far, the one thing in particular that I think may be relevant to the Judiciary Committee is the language in 3258 or 3257, whatever that statute was, uh, that's on the uh, sexual, sexual conduct between assault. DOC employees and and 
inmates, people on probation, parole, et cetera. Is that right? Yeah. That's, that's, that's pretty good, right? Top of my head, yeah. huh? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, that language about how it has to be a supervisory role when the person is on probation, fur furlough, that sort of thing. That that is a very much a judiciary issue as well. I remember that that statute coming out of there. So you want to <coughs> let them know, depending on what you want to do. First, you talk about it first, I suppose, right? Do you what do you think about that um, that qualification mm -hmm. on the on whether someone can be charged when when they're not uh, in a facility? And if you have some thoughts on that, it's probably worth talking to people across the hall about. Kurt? Um, I had one question. I don't think it was answered. Is there a definition of rape? It's sexual uh, assault. Uh, I think there it's was. It's not rape anymore. It's well, sexual assault. Yeah, but the right? rape elimination, it seems to me there should be some definition of rape. There, there is a definition to eliminate. when you went through. Yeah, I thought there was <laughs> in the definition section. I thought was that, yeah, rape. there it is, number nine. Yeah. Kind of circular, I guess. But in state statute, do we our definition of sexual assault is not rape, correct? Correct, yes. And is, a, is our term, our definition of sexual assault broader than the federal definition of rape? Uh, I guess I'd want to compare the details of that before I yeah. immediately gave an answer off the top of my head. I know we've expanded that definition of sexual yes. assault over the years. Absolutely. Okay. So it might be worth it to see because the PREA would have to, the PREA would, I would think, and maybe I'm wrong, at the minimum use the rape definition that's on the federal level, but we could go a little higher if we had to if our sexual assault definition is broader, or would we be limited to the rape definition in PREA? That's an interesting question. Uh, that sort of sets a floor, certainly. Right, it sets a to, floor. Can we do uh, more right. or not? Because I know <laughs> in some environmental <laughs> issues where we carry out the federal law, we have to do the minimum. I mean, what the federal law requires, but we also can go above that. In other places, we cannot. So how does that play in here? I don't know. That may be. I think from understanding yes what no? you had said earlier, there in some ways you already go beyond what PREA requires. So, right. So I would think similar for this. As one, you know, PREA is what you have, the standard you have to meet in order to get compliance, not to to maintain compliance with this annual certification, not be in danger of losing your the five percent funding. Um, but I, I would I don't think there's anything in there that prohibits a state from doing more. Not the way I, I've read it so far. So could you just look? and compare the two definitions, the yeah. federal definition of rape and our definition in yep. the state statute on sexual assault. And then that may give us, just <coughs> circle back with us on that. Yeah, definitely. One way or another, either through um, Phil with sending it or coming back in committee or whatever. Okay, yeah, that sounds good. Or talking to us in the hallway. Sure. <laughs> Anything else? Thank you. Thank yes, you. thank you. So what I would recommend for DOC is while you're here, connect with Phil. We have our new new person, Phil Petty. In terms of what your schedule looks like, poss oh, I don't know, possibly Friday morning around 10 o'clock to noon and next week. What times are available for you? Okay, thank you. And as you can see from today, it would be a good hour and a half, two hours. And who would be the staff person for this? I mean, if we have some, if we're looking in depth here, wouldn't we need a legal, wouldn't we need someone from Ledge Council to also be here for that? I've started, so I can certainly keep covering this. So, and I don't know that I'll, I would be, I have to bounce back and forth. And when witnesses are testifying and I'm not in the chair, obviously we always sort of, uh, do our scheduling based on where we got to be testifying. But I will be happy to be here and keep in touch with you about it and keep an eye on whatever. And please let me know as things yeah, come up yeah, that you think, oh, we could use yep, help on this or that issue, whatever it may be. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. 
great. We'll figure those out. If you could connect with Phil before you leave in terms of what you're, and then we're doing scheduling today so we can figure this out. Anything else before we take a very quick break? Yeah. Thank you. Thank Five you. minutes, Thank you. very quick, and then we're going to do something. Yeah. So, we're switching gears to something really easy. Oh, good. I hope. This, I was asked by Jeff Spaulding back in the fall about our capital funding that goes towards uh, UVM and state colleges. Um, that it goes to their major maintenance that they can use towards a building, you know, construction of a specific building, or their major maintenance. Back when I first came on this committee eons ago, in 1993, the chair at the time was, was Bob Wood, Representative Bob Wood from Brandon. I was vice chair. We, in the Capitol bill, for UVM and state colleges, they alternated, because we only did one year budgets back then. The money was targeted towards a specific construction project like a specific building. If they were building a library, or building a science uh, hall, a science building, or uh, a liberal arts building. It was the academic piece. And the money that we appropriated in that capital bill, one year, the money would go towards, like, Lincoln State Library, or Johnson State Library, or Castleton State Library. The next year, it would go to UVM, to the Davis Center, or to a new science building. And then the third year, we'd go back to the state college and continue funding for that specific building. We always had language in those capital bills that those dollars were not to go towards dorm and dining. And then, I think it was in the late 90s, it was late 90s, maybe early two, late 90s, I think, early 2000s. It got to the point that those dollar amounts that we were appropriating for those individual construction projects <coughs> were not going very far because the projects were getting so expensive. So we worked with UVM and state colleges to say, okay, let's, let's not target those state dollars in the capital budget towards those specific buildings. Let's see if we can do major maintenance, and then you folks can decide, do you want that to go towards a specific construction project building or your major maintenance? And we made this agreement that, say, it was $4 million total that we would allocate the capital bill in the year. One year, state colleges might would get $3 million, UVM would get a $1 million. The next year, that would be flipped. But it would be up to the individual um, facility, the individual uh, college or university to decide major maintenance or target it towards a specific building. We still carry, I believe, the language at that point that said money is not to be used for dorm, dorm and dining. And then I constantly have said this when we've put together the capital budget, these dollars are not for dorm and dining. Eventually, that language never got put in the capital bill all the time. So uh, Chancellor of the college, state college system, Jim Spalding, came to me in the fall and said, you know, we've got some real issues with our major maintenance within our dorm and dining buildings, and we can't use any of this capital dollars for this. And we've done some research and can't find any place that limits these capital dollars uh, to the other buildings and not for dorm and dining doesn't say any place now that we can't use that for dorm, dorm and dining, but you keep saying it in committees, so help us here. So I went to Becky and said, can we do some digging and some research here? Because I was always under the assumption, based from when I first came on the committee in the mid early 90s, um, Bob would always said this at the beginning of the committee, these dollars are not for dorm and dining. So I carried that. It may have been erroneous, it may not have been. Becky did some real digging um, between our that history. Uh, we've kind of come to a conclusion, and I said, well, I'm not making a unilateral decision. I want to bring it before the committee so we can be really clear how we appropriate our capital dollars going forward. So that's what Becky's going to bring us up to speed on. It's going to be easy. 
So I think in some, I, I could also not find anything that limited uh, the state funding, state capital funding to um, to things other than dorms and dining. Um, I did look into the history, the legislative history, um, and I think I see where things started to change, and maybe there was a move from um, having to specifically authorize. Um, the General Assembly having to specifically authorize capital improvements at the Vermont State Colleges and UVM to being more of a general authority, but I just wanted to um, go over what the law says. Um, so in statute for the colleges, um, there's 16 BSA 2171E, which is the section that sets out the, the powers of the colleges. Um, and in that section, you'll see that this, uh, the, the colleges can make expenditures for capital improvements. Um, and this is, that shall be applied solely to costs of reconstruction, rehabil rehabilitation, or improvement of existing facilities at the colleges. So there's a little bit of a restriction there. Um, but again, that's not to what the type of building, it's just, um, it seems to be towards um, not not building a new building, a new construction. Um, similarly, so UVM does not have that similar section um, that the colleges do, the 2171 on making expenditures for capital improvements. <coughs> they do have a similar section on reserve funds, and it's the same language. Interestingly, <coughs> I heard that this was added in the 2008 capital bill. I, I don't know why this is the case, and I, I, you know, I talked to our education attorney, but the, the UVM section is divided into subchapters, and for some reason this is under subchapter three for the College of Medicine, but it does not seem to be specific to that college, but I just note that there seems to be some sort of um, inconsistency there, that this seems to be generally applying to UVM, but is in the... College of Medicine subchapter. Was there any in the Capitol Bill 2008? Was there anything specific to the College of Medicine? No. So I think maybe what happened was that it was just added in the Capitol Bill, not realized like added as a section in the Capitol Bill, not realizing that there had been subchapter designations. So whoever drafted it at the time um, just probably wasn't aware of that. But I just point that out as um, I'm reading this to be general. It, it is in that sub chapter, um, so they have the they have the same um, restriction here in F about uh, if they receive state funds for debt service, it's it can't be used for new construction. Um, and then I because a, a lot of uh, this is not just statutory law, it's what's in session law of the Capitol Bill, which is sometimes much more difficult to track because um, you have to go it's through. It's not in the green books. Yeah, you have to do a lot more digging into past Capitol Bills. Um, so I just wanted to give an example for the colleges of last year's bill where it says the appropriation is, um, it says construction, renovation, and major maintenance. So again, here it's not, it's actually not restricted to any building. It's very general to those three types of uses, construction, renovation, and major maintenance. Um, if you go back to 2007, I put another, I put, I think this is where some, the, some changes started to be made. So, the way it was in 2007 was that you had the appropriation section like you do here in section nine, like in the money part of the bill, and then in the policy part of the bill. Um, this language about the spending and bonding authorization in section 40, that's something that you could find going back to the early 90s, as you said, that said, pursuant to subsection 2171E of title 16, so just as a refresher, that's uh, this, this section up here. So they're saying pursuant to that, um, the General Assembly is 
is authorizing the colleges to expend up to a certain amount of its self-generated revenues is, um, for the purpose of capital improvements. So when you read that now and look at the statute now, it seems like why would you need to do that? Um, but then also in that bill, you can see that there was a change to this section of law. And then it used to say, which is now struck out, that in order for the colleges to make expenditures for capital improvements, the general they needed to get um, prior approval from the General Assembly. So I'm thinking this is where that language originated from and why that was always in the capital bill, that um, sort of authorizing the colleges to use their their self-generated revenues to, to for capital improvements because it used to say that they had to get that approval from the, the General Assembly. And that was taken out, and I think that's why in 2008 you see the shift of no longer having that um, authorization. And I don't know why, I guess, you all decided that maybe you didn't want them to have to come back all the time to, to ask for that, that approval. Not to have to come back. Um, and so again, I just gave another example, 2005, um, where there was the spending <coughs> authorization again, and it was in the policy section of the bill. It was that similar language, and it specifically says um, they can use their self-generated revenues on housing, dining, and general purpose facilities. And then I went all the way back to 1993, mm -hmm. and um, this spending authorization of, of looking back at 2016-2171E at, uh, e was actually in the money section of the bill. Um, so I don't, it seems like there, over time there was a shift from keeping everything in the money section and appropriate, appropriating specifically for certain buildings to more general appropriations to then not requiring any authorization um, for for spending on capital improvements. But I, all that being said, I could not find <laughs> anything that restricted it. I mean, this language does restrict it. <clears throat> Over time, we've let go of the language. Right. So the question before us is the state colleges have requested, not UBM at this point, for the money that's in the capital bill for major maintenance, for them to have the ability to use that for their dorm and dining facilities as well. That's the issue. What do they do with their dorm money? Well, obviously, they don't maintain. Well, that's why they want to make a unilateral decision. I mean, you know, <coughs> as they've looked, I said there's nothing in statute, there's nothing that prohibits those capital dollars to be used for dorm and dining facilities, except what I've been saying for how many years? Whatever. What Bob Wood first said, and then I carried it through, so that's why I went to Becky and said, can we do some digging here? Because I was under, always under that impression. So that's the digging that she's done, and it really comes to a point that looks like, well, maybe we shouldn't limit it. But I'm not making that decision in the lab, so we've got to bring it back to Sarah, I just have a question. What do you think the rationale was behind limiting it in that way? Do you because they were getting general fund dollars, and and I think it was connected. The money was targeted towards a specific building. Historically, yeah, yeah. like the Davis Center or like Johnson State Library or the Linden Library, and we wanted to make sure the money went to that project mm -hmm. and not to it. something else. And then the project wouldn't get done. Well. We wanted to make sure it went to that project. Um, and those were academic buildings. And that was the feeling. It's part of our state system. They were academic buildings. It wasn't a living building, and it wasn't a dining room. Dining room. And I think that, because our money, they weren't going to those or at the time. Our capital dollars were not going to those buildings. They were going to the academic buildings, like the science building, or the uh, nursing building, or the library. I don't even think it went to a gym. I'm not sure if it even went to a gym. It might have, but I'm not sure on that. And then we gradually made that shift to be used for major maintenance. And then the 
college and university system could determine whether that amount that we appropriated went towards their major maintenance, but only limited to those academic buildings, not the dorm and dining. Or they could put it towards a specific building if they wanted to, such as a library or an academic building, but not dorm and dining. And gradually, we've let go of the language about dorm and dining. So the question is, can the money be used for their dorm and dining facility as well? Felicia? Could it have been, um, when, when that language is initially included, restricting dorm and dining, that they wanted to fund like college existence, academia, in that space, but not the optional housing and meals for students that chose to be residential on campus. I think that's less applicable to some of the state colleges, like Johnson State College, or the measure now. But those campuses are much more closed, much more residential oriented. UVM wasn't. Could that have been the premise? Is that I'm not following what you're saying. What am I missing here? Could the restriction have been born out of a desire to only fund academic buildings that were necessary to the college's operation rather than what could have been perceived as optional buildings that the college chose to have for students that opted into residential halls and dining meals? And that goes back to Marsha's question, they're paying room and board. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And do we have a duty to fund the college's operation? And does a non-residential requirement residence hall fall into that operation? Because I know some colleges, the one I went to, it was mandatory <coughs> that you stayed on campus. UVM is not that way. I don't think any of our colleges are that way. Are our state colleges that way for our freshmen and sophomore? I moved off <laughs> campus my sophomore year at Charles. Yeah. Freshman year. I believe it's for freshmen. But freshmen is required. But so, I Johnson. And what it did, I mean, CCV is a completely different model. So right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, not CCV. I'm yeah. talking about Johnson, <coughs> Castleton. Because right. right. when I was in Johnson years ago, yeah. uh, I was on campus for my freshman year and one semester of my sophomore, and I moved off campus. A lot of people moved off campus. Yeah, yeah so was it because if there's not a requirement to stay on campus, then that is not integral to the operation of the college, technically, in know. some perspectives. I don't know. I don't know. And a follow-up question to that is, do we need to look at the language surrounding our obligation to fund our state colleges and see if there was an exemption there? Well, that would be in your general fund or the other. And you didn't find anything, right? No, I mean, I was looking more for capital funding. I didn't. I didn't look at the op because these are the, the question I think was more specific to capital improvements. Is that correct? Um, so I didn't look at the okay. general fund obligation, like the uh, funding the operating costs. I don't know if there's like something specific in our obligation to fund the colleges that exempts those buildings because of their <coughs> non necessity but non requirement of students. If that makes any sense, it, it was just kind of where it came from and why we did it. <coughs> thought question. You, you might want to do some digging on the general fund side in terms yeah. of the monies that we appropriate there for operating. If they have any limitations or language that might, kind of, I don't know. Yeah. 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 Although I think, I mean, isn't the question more of buildings because that that wouldn't be in the general fund, right? Right, but so. if there's language that's connected somehow to the general fund dollars that go there for operating, if there's any linkage to other dollars that are appropriate elsewhere, be it the capital, <coughs> might have one. I, I don't know. I just want to cover the bases. I want to look under every yeah. stone and people only say, yeah, go ahead. I feel like if it was such a prevalent you no know, dorm and dining for such a long time, it had to come from somewhere concrete. I just feel like it might be there. 
Well, that's somewhat common. I mean, it was connected. I think it really is connected because we used to target those dollars towards a specific yeah. building. Yeah. And we didn't want that build those dollars to go to another building at that time. Right. I think that's where it's more connected. Mm -hmm. I can see how you bought into it because I know, knew Bob. You knew Bob, yeah. And, and if he said something, uh, <laughs> okay. well, he, well, he was he was he was pretty good. About he it. was pretty sharp on yeah. this. Yeah. So you know, I just carried it through. So it's all your fault, Bob. <laughs> um, I did I did connect with our education attorney on it. I can I can maybe talk to JFO if they've ever heard anything for the budget bill. Um, I didn't see anything. I looked at the the. Um, State colleges section of law, and I did not see any other, even about operating expenses. I didn't see anything in statute. Um, so I can I can see if the budget bill has historically ever had anything. Would Catherine be able to help you on that? Um, yeah, I can. I can talk to her about and it. And Stephanie Barrett, maybe. Mm -hmm. Do you have any insight from state colleges here? Just identify. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Jonathan Wolf from Primer Piper on behalf of the Vermont State Colleges uh, System. Um, I would, if you're looking back to the general fund, a law going back to the 1960s basically said that the, um, the Vermont State College shall be supported in whole or in part um, by, and you'll, you'll hear this a lot, in, 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 say in whole or in part, I think 50% for the general fund operations. But for, we're at less than 20% now um, for our, our revenues. Yeah. State budget. So, you know, when we talk about the the funding for the state college system from the general fund side of things, from our perspective, we would like to see that actually increase even more to help cost and drive down the tuition on the back end of it. Um, on this side of things, I think <coughs> you're absolutely correct. We were looking into it as well. That uh, on this side of things, I mean the, the, the dorm dining question specifically. We were looking into it, and we currently actually do use um, some of we we have way more than two million dollars worth of um, maintenance issues on our campuses, um, and we prioritize them from priority one. And we look at life life safety, we look at um, uh, um, security, we look at compliance, and when we looked at the dorms and dining, we were we were using some of that money for like the roof or the exterior stuff. Um, that needed to be addressed and the, the bigger ticket items. Um, but we also um, were looking at, so electrical and plumbing inside bathrooms, stuff that could be fixed up with some of this money that we have identified as a priority within the system to address on those, on that first million to be split up. And we kept coming back to, well, we can't necessarily do this because. Because I said so. <laughs> because yeah, that's that's what it was. Yeah. Yeah. She said so. So that was where the clarify, clarity whether we could try to address some of these concerns. <coughs> Um, uh, as far as dorms and dining fees, my understanding, some of that does go back into capital projects. We have way more than $2 million worth of projects that need to be addressed as far as maintenance and upgrades and, and, and so forth that, that, we're, that we're looking at. So that was kind of, could we use some of this as we're focusing our campus and prioritize the level of, of need and, and looking at the dorm and looking at the dining, if we could go there. So. You know, and Thinking this through, Rick, I think it was connected because because there's room and board charge. Yeah. And I think that's because yeah, there was a revenue <laughs> source there for those buildings mm -hmm. that there isn't for the other buildings. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But right. uh, in my conversation with Jim, and he was talking to me about this, and you might have been sitting at the table with him too, is today. Uh, when the modern student goes to look at a college, the first thing they look at is the dorms. Mm -hmm. The second thing they look at is the dining and, and student, what I would call the student union. They don't care about the academic they, you know, they go, oh yeah, there's classroom mm -hmm. one. And the sports arenas. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and what's, what's the gym look like? So right. I think uh, my takeaway on the thing was uh, that you know, we would really like to use some of this money to fix up the facilities that prospective mm -hmm. students see first. Mm -hmm and uh, something right. kind of as a recruiting tool uh, to stay competitive with other privates that are going out of business. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, and, uh, but the, the, the history, and we certainly wouldn't want to tread on any statutory requirements. So my question to you is, Alice, is uh, if it's in the capital bill, is that just good for one for the session just, or just, just for the year yeah. of that capital bill so yeah. anything that's in the capital bill we wouldn't have to fix if necessary um 
Yes, and I guess I would say there's, but there's nothing otherwise saying you can't do it. So it would be good for that. To clarify. Yeah, it would be good for that specific appropriation, but there's also, I don't see anything in statute that says there's a, con that, that would create a conflict otherwise. Um, I mean, if you wanted to change statute to clarify it, but I just, I don't think that, I don't think it's something that is screaming to be clarified, <laughs> I guess. So um, we made a decision here that yes, the capital dollars could be used for dorm and dining for both UVM and state colleges. We would not have to stay, change any statute. And we wouldn't have to say anything in the capital bill either? Um, I think it, it might be helpful just to, because it seems like this has been done based on <coughs> sort of tradition and precedent. Mm -hmm. So if it might be helpful, you know, Alice 10 makes. years from now when I am asked why did, you change, <laughs> why did you change to go to dorms and dining, I can look back and I can say, well, this is the year that the committee decided to do that. Um, so it might be helpful to just say somewhere, you know, that it could be used for that, just, just to have it out there um, in case there's any confusion about it. I think we should do something. Um, but I, I guess what I'm saying is I don't think that it needs to be statutorily clarified. I think maybe the capital bill is unique in how it's, could, could we figure it's out based on session yes. law. So, you know, if you wanted to start making appropriations um, more general to um, include dorms and dining, oh, you know, it might be helpful to yeah. make that clear in this specific would be, appropriation. Would it be wise not to have to call out dorms and dining and just make the language clear that, like you just said, for all facilities? All on facilities campus. on campus? Yeah. Holy yeah. mm -hmm. shopping. <sighs> Never mind. <laughs> 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 So where are we as a committee? Are we meaning to go in that direction or not? Yes. Yes. Yeah. I don't mind doing it as long as they don't come back and say, you know, we put all our money into dorms and dining and now we need help with other things because, you know, there's a limit. Yes. Other folks? I would also like to see that we use it for academic and dorm and dining rather than administrative buildings. As a personal preference, um, just wanted to express that. But I don't know if we want to go restricting more buildings. Okay. Well, I remember at Johnson State when I was first here, the dorm I was in, the administrative floor was below the dorms <laughs> in the same building. <laughs> Top two floors were dorm and the bottom floor were administrative buildings. I have a niece that's going to Johnson right now and one that's going to Linden State right now. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that building at Johnson is still. <coughs> Use for both. Uh, Kurt, did you have something? No, no, I'm good. So one thing I'd like to do is have you work with Joint Fiscal Committee, JFO Joint Fiscal Office, and see if there's anything in the general plan. Um, <coughs> if we're so inclined to do this, I think we really need to work on the language to figure out how we want to structure it. And then what I would then lead to is to take a specific committee roll call vote mm -hmm. on that language so that at least we have a record of legislative intent and we have a, an actual roll call vote so that there's something to go back to. That's my thinking. <laughs> what? <laughs> That'll be the... Uh Taking Alice off of a book. <laughs> <laughs> Taking Bob Wood off. Bob is probably spinning this way. I saw myself as shoes. Shoes moving. <laughs> careful. They're going kind of Carl, be careful that, that, that those pair of shoes may land on your head here. <laughs> 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 Might dent them. Yeah. <laughs> Might dent them. Does that make sense? Yes. Becky, maybe you can find that out with the general fun thing. Maybe start working language that maybe we can start working on and then we'll schedule it. Can you get that done by next week? You should be able to. Yeah. And then just circle back with Phil and we'll schedule you in when we have a time when we're not sure what we're doing on the floor. And, and, and so I'm I'm taking that to mean to be similar to what like for example what 
subsection A is here, <coughs> 9A, um, like a sum of money is appropriated to the colleges for, you know, construction, re renovation, and major maintenance, and then you just want to add something, that, into something that's general about facilities versus, so just to clarify that it, it is not um, excluding any buildings. Right, but then Based Marcia on the has committee's the concern that it's going yeah. to be shifted too much to dorm and dining at the expense of the academic buildings. And we have construction in there, and I thought it was most Yeah, maybe we'll take a Take out. the word construction out, because it's mainly for renovation and major maintenance. It's not for a new building. Right. right. But it depends how you define construction. Right. This gets yeah. weedy. Mm -hmm. We've got to start with some language mm -hmm. to wordsmith. So process in your legal mind, and then we'll start with some language. And Felicia, sorry. Um, we could address concerns by saying that academic buildings are a priority, but money may be used for all other buildings when necessary, so that we don't see the shift over. We're still kind well, of giving that money its availability so like coach said we can attract yeah, students. The problem with that could be they really may need the infusion over the next few years. Okay. In Dorman Dining and then it's going to look like it's more weighted and the priority is your academics so where does that leave that and I'm wondering if we do something like a report back for the next few years to see <coughs> proportion and maybe we get into proportion. We do this with VHCB, Housing Conservation Board. Yeah. For housing and land conservation over time, it has to meet this certain percentage. So some years it may be, or it's over, is it a three-year cycle or something that some years it's higher, more money is going to land conservation than the housing, and other years is more for housing than land, but over time it meets what we've put in statute. I don't know if that's a way to do it. I just one other thought is that um, I think the testimony was that there is a lot more um, that needs to be done than there is an appropriation for. In general. Um, so I, it might be helpful just to get testimony on, um, like, practically speaking. I mean, if you put in some percentage or weighting, you know, what does that actually mean? I'm, I'm, I don't know if the needs of those buildings are more than other buildings or I mean I don't I don't know if there's like a list of sort of the, the maintenance projects that need to be done um, so just it might be helpful to inform that discussion to hear what the actual needs are well we'll have to give me an end state college we'll sit together okay. madam chair um, I, I'm just peeing back on what, what Becky and, and, and said there's uh, the, the, the capital appropriation that comes in gets divvied up between the four campuses equally to address the priorities. So if you think about mm -hmm. all of that, you're, you're thinking if there's two million in this year, that's 500,000 per campus roughly, or a little bit less probably, because mm -hmm. of uh, other things. But, um, so you're not talking about a large amount of money here to be apportioned out or split up or prioritized within um, a waiting system. I'd be, I'd be really um, cautious on, on that, or even limiting the language that we currently have now um, to address the concern um, uh, about I, 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 I mean we can work on language together but it can be, you know maybe, maybe it's just for all construction generation major I mean you're talking about 500,000 is not going to build you a brand new dorm it's not going to build you a brand new anything. it's going to address the needs of the, the, the interior stuff is what we're looking at right now as far as within those those things that we've kind of been hesitant to put up on the prior to us up front. But a report back would be, I mean, that might be the way to kind well, of... That's what I'm thinking of. Yeah. Back for the first few years. First few years, how we yeah, actually we realize that. Well, the commitment every other year with the capital will uh, capital request, request. Yeah. and then we we require them now to come back, come in with a list. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have the, 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 the I think the sure. submitted testimony from last year from yeah. Jay. From the chancellor would have the list of all the all the all the deferred maintenance projects and projects that <coughs> and I do have a, a, a list of where the, this year's money is going. Um, so. so let's see if we can next week schedule if you can noodle some language 
And then if we can schedule, it's going to be harder to get UVM down here, maybe. But uh, what's her name? She's here. I know. What is her name? Uh, Wendy. 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 We can connect with Wendy. <coughs> what's her last name? Cole? Conan. Conan. Um, and if you could, it would be nice to have Deb here if possible. Okay. Yeah. Um, see if we can schedule some time next week with Becky and you being the state colleges and really work through the wordsmithing, trying to figure it out. Because I think we're in agreement in concept that the money could go to dorm and dining, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I know Kurt has a big question mark on his forehead. I'm just, I would just say there's nothing in statute that says they can't. Let them do it. <laughs> Move on to something well, else. I have an official act to You know, I, re I realize. So we're all in agreement, yes. correct? Yes. Okay, it's just how we get there. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it just seems like a policy decision of the committee of how much, how restrictive you want the language to be. Um, you know, do you want to allow it, but you know, only under certain circumstances, or do you want to just say, you know, here's the money and, and we'll go with it. Go with it. <laughs> so, do you have enough direction in terms of figuring out the language? Actually? Sure. <laughs> and check with JFO about if there's anything else with General yeah. Fund and John. That if you can get back, well, I don't know you or Phil, somebody work with Jeb and UVM, Wendy Cohen. If we run into Wendy, can we have her come in here and talk to? Sorry, yes, yes, she yeah, I saw she yes, she had a she, she had a doctor's coming this morning, so she didn't make it. She messed up her shoulder pretty good. If you've seen it, it looks kind of like it's what happened? Did she fall? She's got a great story about a vacation trip, and she fell off of she basically fell, but <laughs> fell off the <laughs> fell off a boat, fell off the shoulder. Um, <laughs> she broad, it was the end of last session, so yeah. I think six, eight months later, it'd be better. So, pretty, pretty, yeah, so she, she needed to get that looked at. Yeah, because um, I want UVM to be in the room as well. <coughs> you had the contact, right, Phil, of the people who connected at UVM from Danielle? I, uh, I don't recall, but I will check the check list. Check the list because we've had UVM in. We don't need the president. He is planning on coming. I know he is, but that, that's a different story. But we don't need the president for this. We need somebody. I saw him on the Mott this week, though. Yeah, no, it's certainly a different yeah. attitude. Yeah, I heard, I saw the thing on the Mott this week. I was pretty impressed. I, I was going to turn it off and say, I'm not interested. Yeah, way better. Right? Yeah. Doesn't like that. Yes. Can I say one thing that's slightly different? Sure. Um, next Wednesday from 7.30 to 8.30 in the morning, all the presidents will be over at the Capitol Plaza for a light breakfast that you're all invited for. So right. if you want to, I put it in your mailbox, mailbox this morning, but um, they're doing that. And since I was here, I figured I'd take the opportunity to re readdress that. And then the following week on the 22nd, um, it is CCD's 50th anniversary mm -hmm. and they'll be having cake in the Cedar Creek when they're going to have to spend that new. 50th brings it to what, what years? 50th was in 1970. 70? Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. That was Peter Smith? Yep. Was he going to be here? I don't know. It's going to be dry. I, 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 I don't think so because President Judy hadn't noted that. So, but we've got um, uh, There'll be a resolution on the floor, and then we have um, uh, Dylan is going to speak, and Jimmy's going to speak, and we can invite him down there. We're going to try to keep it. Yeah, there's going to be some students in the building, and there'll be uh, some of our faculty there. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll circle back sometime next week. Sounds good. Yeah, put it in somewhere. It should take an hour's discussion, I'm hopeful. Thank you. It should be more, but no one else <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, we can go off, Parker. What are you doing over there, Eric? Well, it's a committee discussion in the schedule. That's like catnip to me. <laughs> 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 you should have been. You should have been here this morning. Uh, I can't get over how they can have sixty million dollars in deferred maintenance. I mean, do you do you take care of your own house? Well, that's any income. Okay. 
I got a lot. I can have. I look around my house. I have a lot of deferred income. I mean, deferred. <laughs> deferred income. It's true. <laughs> Things I really would like to do. I was at a meeting yeah. at Linden, Me. well, Northern Universe, whatever you want to call it, and Jeb was there, and Dylan was there, and they were having a meeting about going, having more online courses instead of having, you know, come to school courses. Right. Mm -hmm. Well. We, I went to that thing, and I'll tell you, those kids, when that, they were in that meeting, they were standing up, carrying on, you know, like, they said, what do you do with the, you know, all the money we give you for tuition? Said, we pay you $33,000 a year, we live here, and now you want to dump on us? And that, that meeting got so out of hand, it was unreal. And Jeb just kind of sit there going. <laughs> well, I think Campuses all of our... Campuses are expensive. I, I, I don't think any of our colleges whether the state colleges or private are immune to the pressure today of oh. declining enrollment and yeah, I lack don't either. of funding. Yeah. I mean, three three in Southern Vermont, Mayor. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, there's been a lot of them. Yeah. And they're, having a, they're actually having to give higher discount rates so students, to get the students to yeah. Yeah. because oh, yeah. there's so much more competition mm -hmm. to yeah. put it down, which is point. It's, our colleges are under extreme duress. It's interesting that we haven't done a tuition reset, so we don't have to give such extreme discounts. It's been on our bailing work for yeah. yeah. So, so I'm a committee discussion time just to kind of check in. I know it's the second day of the session. It feels like seems April. like a month. <laughs> <laughs> just came right back from <laughs> um, See where we are as committee members and topics. We had quite a discussion this morning. We have an update on the capital bill from the commissioner yesterday. What else did we deal with? Oh, yeah. <coughs> Secretary Smith. Yeah. I just wanted a time to check in and see where pe what people are thinking, uh, what's come to the surface for some of the, for the committee, for what, uh -oh, what we should be looking oh, at. Oh, Mary, it's for you? <laughs> no, it's for Butch. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea, and I don't want to know. I don't want to know. It's from the ACLU. It says all is forgiven. It's John saying, you told who? <laughs> <laughs> I hope it's not for me. It is for you. It's right. It doesn't it have you. a card. It doesn't have a card. So we don't have any of the flowers breathe, or would you like to do that? I don't know if you can open it. Aww. The clerk's with his name. Hey, uh. <laughs> From a secret admirer? Yeah. 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 Saying, no, don't do it. <laughs> Oh, these are nice. oh, there's a card. Oh, there is a card. Oh, there is a card. Oh, I saw the card. Oh, yeah, well, you did. I didn't yeah. see Maybe it's for the committee. Yeah. 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 You're okay. Good. Okay. You don't do it. <laughs> Maybe it's from a committee member. Maybe I'll, I'll turn away while you're reading it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. That's so Super. nice. Yay! You must be happy you told us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Eric's out of the loop. He doesn't know yet. It's okay. I'm out of loop on a lot of stuff. Yeah, you can tell. Safe for that. She's getting. So Alice, we'll stand next. Yeah. What? <laughs> I mean, Mazel Tov. <laughs> what? what? Are you going to put up with her? <laughs> no, I don't know. Well, well, let's just take a picture. That's the first thing I call my husband when I go home. Go to, I'll what take a say? picture, I'll email it to you, and you can send it to John. Well, oh, sure. yeah, I was just going to take a picture. We'll just take a picture. No, his so first question was, to John. so John must be feeling better. Yeah. I'm going to say that. And I think he's feeling alone. Get in the get in the picture. Now. I don't want to be loud. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want to be not, not now. Smile. Yeah. I don't want to be in the picture. Now. You're in. You no. should be in the picture. Yeah, I don't want yeah. to be there right He'll now. He'll be in the picture. That'll be more. Yeah, it makes yeah. you more interesting. Yeah. 
him having me. Yeah, that doesn't me. Okay. <laughs> you want to Alice. FaceTime him right now? Alice. <laughs> that was perfect. That's Alice, great. we Absolutely need great. a picture of you with the flowers. Yes, we do. So John can... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right here, can you get another one just like it? <laughs> this, is called, this is called she, committee feedback. No, she's, 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 she's saying to John, I'm number one. Don't forget. <laughs> it's so embarrassing. It's well, no, not. it's not. It's, it's not. just it's it's starting. It's it is. It is. It's just starting. But I don't want it to be like this. Well, you don't have a choice right now. Alice? You're not in control. You know that? You're not in control. No, it's all good. It really yeah, it's yeah. really great. Do you need great. her closer to the yeah, yeah. yeah, or else well, the pot's going to come here. No, she goes right away. I've got her yeah. over here. There you go. She's going to put it right in her face. No. <laughs> Alice. Alice, I'm ready. Behave. Yeah. <laughs> Those are pretty. Beautiful. And yeah. Kurt has got the right attitude. He's wearing your face. Kurt's not looking. They're bigger than you. Very pretty. They're beautiful. So, Absolutely. how bad did that picture come out? Lovely. She's all got it all well, on Facebook now. Good. No. I didn't get a lovely one there, Alice. Oh, I got a good one there. <laughs> that's not good. I can't believe it. Oh, that's great. Say, say, that's great. That'll great. mean the world. That's great. <laughs> Alice, that will mean the world to me. Yeah. And you know, all cap is standing up on that scaffold. <laughs> <laughs> These are going to be so <laughs> You always get to the numbers in the end, don't you? <laughs> and that's how you guys know. Is there a good one? Yeah. That, that could be a. Uh, yeah, yeah, that is a good one. I said you went. Oh my God. Ted, let's have a ball All right, we'll put these back up so they're not in your face. But yeah. I think it was some of the schedule. Yeah, I was just so embarrassed. You didn't have to do that. Well, they were yeah. going to have something built. I know, I've been out on a plank. Yeah, yeah. I don't like it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to tell you. I prefer scaffolding to the little bucking that it does in there. That's great. Out. You should take that out like, on the desk. I am not going to be mm -hmm. out. No! <laughs> Are you kidding me, Grace? Are you crazy? Yes! Let me carry it out for you. No! You start to shake, and then it starts to shake. Don't you see that? They haven't said anything either. I would I would start. Oh, there we go. What? You got it. She can go really? stay behind. Yeah. No. And all the access to. It's okay. This happens on Facebook Live. Well, we want to no. get. We want to get. A, 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 we want your announcement in ahead of Lieutenant Governor. <laughs> 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 I've got that longer in here. Now you're scared. Yeah, somebody's going to stand up and say something. Just an hour. He's talking about kind of twins. He's an hour. Like all these. Jesus. I'm going to get a refrigerator. Oh my God. Don't wait. Did you see that? Oh my god, he was adorable. He was really the idiot. Oh, I just want to see him in all the sound so it didn't shine. I want to see that in the This one's been shining. Yeah. Oh, I thought it turned all of it. No, no, no. I'm going to be here for you. I'm going to be here for you. I'm going to be here so, well, if you know. weren't getting married, how old were you? Would you be? Sixty-five. Okay. So Maybe we ought to send him some condolences. <laughs> you guys want to send him flowers at home to say yeah. <laughs> condolences? <laughs> you know what you got to put up with? No. No, I think he knows what he's getting into, Alice. If you don't by now, he yeah. never will. Yeah. <laughs> I love Eric's reaction. What? <laughs> 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 you what else? What's Chris's kind of reaction be? I, I should probably uh, save that information. I, yes, you I probably hope. want to see his face. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, poor John. <laughs> what? It's lovely news. Yeah. yeah it's just, really nice. just not what I was expecting this morning. March 7th. <laughs> you thought she was going March 7th. Is her party? I know. Tell me anyway. It would have been wow. back We're inviting 180 plus. Yeah. No. <laughs> no. And we're all very small. And we're we're all going to show up in premier buses. Yes. <laughs> and not dead yet. <laughs> oh. oh my God. Oh, oh no. no. Oh. It's not that was overwhelming. Oh, I know no. it was, but I was thinking that on the way in this morning how overwhelming it was. That was. I saw those buses turn in, and I just went <clears> over. <throat> yeah. and, uh, and it was pretty teary. I it was pretty teary. I saw that. <clears throat> Where are you getting married? Um, we're looking at a restaurant down in Rockingham. That's small, small venue. And guess who's going to be the JV? We could always four wall the dorm 
and dining hall at Windsor. They've got a really nice kitchen. <laughs> there, you go. there you go. And Alice Nick is going to be the justice. Is wow. That, is that <laughs> that's wonderful? great. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's a little scary. And poor Phil is so new to this. He's like, why, why is it scary? <laughs> yeah, no, no. Holy cow. Yeah, yeah, now what? So family wants to donate two million pounds to me. Oh, good. Oh, you did Just click on this link. Oh, yeah. We all get that. We yeah, all get that. Yeah, double click. Yeah. 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 I've already spent a million of it. It's <laughs> that great. Is. We used to get those all the time in the general home. Yeah. My relative has passed away. Yeah. Yeah. The right yeah. funny, but the minute I look there, it's like, no, I didn't. <laughs> I haven't heard of text yet. Uh, what did I? I did. I texted you. Oh, you texted me, right? No, I emailed the picture. Yeah. Just a picture. I emailed it. Do you want me to send it? Thank you, sir. Okay. Phil, did you get a question? I was really hoping it was just somebody else. Can you answer your question? Oh, um, Alice. What and I just I... arrived? <laughs> <laughs> he says, What just arrived? He says, Robbie, what just arrived? <laughs> Maybe you better go back and read it. Maybe it's from another job. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Just arrived. What just arrived? <laughs> I took a picture and I wrote to him, Just arrived. And then he writes back, what just arrived? Things <laughs> off ground. Are you kidding me? Maybe he forgot. You <laughs> have another boyfriend? <laughs> <laughs> the the uh, sensory room in Springfield is being Sense. built out in the caseworker office. Just you tell me that A that's block. not true. Oh, no. Okay, so it's not in A. It's not in A. It's just outside A. Do you know where the one is in no. CRCF? No, uh, the I know. I know. Oh, yeah. huh. okay. Is there another John? <laughs> Dear? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's another John. Did he not get the picture at the same time? He did. <laughs> <laughs> I know. He's questioning. I know. I said on the picture, he said, funny, just arrived. And he goes, what oh, just man. arrived? And then I just sent him the other picture of me holding it. <clears throat> anyway, let's get back to the picture. <laughs> His current <laughs> is one What's the status with Woodside? We don't know, and we're not going to know. What's going to happen with Woodside? Is it's going to be secret. Mm -hmm. No, it's going to be a long process to figure it out. It's going to be beyond this committee. It's going to be what? Beyond yeah. this committee. It's a policy decision in terms of juveniles and where they're going to be held. And it's an issue that... that I said the flowers are pretty. <laughs> so but isn't juvenile detention part of DOC? Isn't that our policy? No. Well, no, it's DCF. DCF. Yeah. It's DCF. <clears throat> Woodside is under DCF, okay. not DOC. And okay. then this ties into juvenile delinquents and it ties into youthful offenders. So there is a little bit that we're going to get involved in, I think. I don't know. On the House side, Human Services Committee is going to be the hub for Woodside issues, and they're going to and Judiciary will be working on it as well because you're going to be dealing with youthful offenders, and then everything. Of course, the juvenile delinquents come through the courts, and all of, and you know they've got to figure out if your census is going to be four or five kids at any point in time, where are they going to be housed? Are they going to be in a hotel room with somebody? In somebody's office? I mean, some of these kids are going to have, they need to be placed somewhere. And what's that somewhere going to be? So once that policy decision is made, also appropriations will be involved in this, because the budget address mm -hmm. from the governor will include zero for mm -hmm. Winsome, effective July 1st. Well, we went through this with the Windsor Correctional. So, yeah, they zeroed it out effective July 1st. Well, and then it got extended six more months before the facility was closed. Same dynamics could happen here with the Um And the other piece that will play in, we don't know 
Oh, I have to start in the House because it will really be a decision in the budget when they do the general fund budget for FY21. Are they going to put any money in? <coughs> That's another piece working with Human Services Committee. So some of that's out of our bailiwick. <clears throat> and then you've got Senator Sears that's really involved in this too. Yeah. So there's forces out there in the building that we're not going to be in control of. We're not going to know. We're in a wait and see, which then impacts if they look at what side for secure residential. <laughs> That's in, that's in terms of policy, but in terms of institutions and construction and things like that. We can't reallocate the money until we know what we're doing. Yeah. <clears throat> we can't go forward with secure residential if that's going to be one of the sites, a state on site. Do you know? And we're not going to know that until we. So. We're not going to know that until we adjourn. Because what's going to happen is we'll have a proposal from the appropriations committee upstairs for how much money for what side. FY21, it could be for three months, it could be for six months, it could be for no months. Then you got the policy piece in terms of where where they're gonna go, these the juveniles. How many do they have in there now? Do you know? I don't know <coughs> what we have today. Do you by any chance? I don't know. Was it one or two? So so those are <laughs> policy questions that are out of our purview. Because when I talked to Ken Schatz when we were over here in December, and he says uh, <coughs> that only happened one day, so I just wondered about how many were in there. Well, if, if, if a juvenile, I mean, there was a situation there in December <coughs> where there was a juvenile, two juveniles, what, 15, 16, uh, yeah, that entered into a grandmother's house, mm -hmm. and now and they were being charged as an adult. And there were houses at Woodside pending it. It was a criminal, and there are charges on the dock. So then where we come in on a situation like that, what they're thinking is, well, maybe they could house that juvenile in the Rutland Correctional Facility mm -hmm. that would be separated by sound, sound and separation, uh, sound and sight separation. Mm -hmm. And so my question is, do we really want our juveniles mm -hmm. to be driven to a correctional facility? Mm -hmm. Look at that one from, from St. Johnsbury that was at Woodside. raised so much havoc. They put it in, I think, Rutland. And they picked on it down there. I don't know where the little bladder is in. I mean, those, that, that may be where we get involved in something like that. If they're going to be housed in a correctional facility, maybe where we get involved. But, we don't have a decision. We're not part of that policy decision per se about Woodside and who's housed there. But those decisions are going to have real ramifications on how we move forward. So we don't know. So it's really important to pay attention to what happens in the hallways. Or you a lot of thoughts. I don't want to put them out right now. Does that make sense, Kurt? The park living. Yes. So it's a big we don't know. Just like when we close the mm -hmm. It was here today, gone tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Basically. So I had a different question. Can we go with what side? Um, you know, I noticed um, in the JFO presentations this mm -hmm. December mm -hmm. that there was Know, some special remarks made about DOC's budget, um, and so the what were those budget, special remarks? Well, they just all they just fun. they always you're right they always point to it. And I remember last session, um, Kurt had said kind of looking at DOC budget. We got to see a little bit of that. I don't know. We I know there's a lot on this committee's plate, but it, I I noticed it just because you know there's a, there's a talking about like that thing, how that budget is growing <laughs> and if with justice reinvestment and some of the policy stuff that's probably going to be recommended and seeing some of the preliminary um, recommendations that come somewhere around finances and budgeting, would it be helpful? I would, if we're going to tackle that, it would be, it might be helpful to better understand DOC's budget 
I don't know we if that's can in try. our purview. If that's no, our no, that would really... be good. That would be good to do. I will just, every time we have, we haven't <laughs> really gone nice. into detail. Because they don't have a great way to present it. <coughs> it's it's really, like they really... present it in the world of appropriations, and we don't understand that presentation. You know, when Stephanie Barrett comes in here, it's a different world, and oh, yeah. you can't follow it. Well, he can't follow the accounting it. program. And Matt is gone. Oh, Matt D'Agostino. Yeah. 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 yeah, he's gone. He yeah. moved to a private uh, job. Well, They're in turmoil. I know they are in turmoil. So I don't, I, this is not to add to the turmoil. It's really just to be able to be a step ahead of some of the decisions that we're going to be faced with. I would imagine. Okay. Put it down. I mean, JFO, I don't know if JFO can put it in simple terms for us to understand. Because <clears throat> what we've had in the past, they just give us the documents they give upstairs. Don't you I don't know if it would be worth it to have Mary come in. Mary, who, who's our, who's our? Mary. Mary. Yeah, I am. It's me and Mary. You and Mary. <coughs> I wonder. <coughs> Mary is an appropriation. She knows how yeah. no, but deep that goes. I wonder if you two sat down with Mary. You're talking Mary Morsey and you. Or no, no, no. you're talking Mary Hooper? No, I think it's yeah, it's Mary and Hooper and maybe me and Felicia. Yeah. 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 Maybe if you two and Mary Hooper sat down. Could we ask Mary to give us a presentation on the DOC budget yeah, and how she, it uh, yeah. in a way that we can understand? That may be tough for her to right. have that amount of time to do that. Right. That's okay. why I'm thinking if you two reached out to Mary Hooper and said, Hey, we really want to understand DOC's <coughs> budget. Can you help us right. yeah. figure out how we okay. can do this? Yep. Yep. Um, I've also got to reconnect with energy and technology to make sure I'm not missing anything on the integrated eligibility because I was our liaison up there as well. Okay. Yeah, we're going to be looking. Dan Smith is coming in this afternoon. Yeah. Maybe you could let <coughs> Tim Brigland know that we're taking testimony from Dan Smith. I think that's sure. Thursday afternoon. Well, that's tomorrow afternoon. Well, okay. Let, I'll let, let you know. Tim Brickland know that. And you know Danielle is now their committee assistant. I upstairs. do. Upstairs. Yeah. That's a good fit for her. I can't yeah. figure that out. She's huh? important. Oh, Steve Whitaker? Oh, Steve Whitaker? <laughs> oh, yeah. That's right. Oh, that's really uh, cool. Well, but you know, he what? actually sits outside of this restroom. Wait. At, uh, yeah, but that would make, make it even no, worse. What are we doing with him? Nothing. 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 <laughs> and Danielle's committee. Danielle's now the committee assistant for energy and technology. Oh, yeah. He's yeah. in the room yeah. all day long. Oh, oh. Oh, he's trying to track, I don't know if he's caught anybody else yet, but he wanted to track down our committee to discuss why we hadn't done the sound renovations yet. Oh, we're going to get into that. He Did you hear her? We're going to get into that. Did you hear her yesterday? You'll have a better idea. You'll have a better idea. Yeah. And we're going to take you. You let us know yesterday. Pardon? You let us know yesterday. Oh, I did. <laughs> so we're working on it. <laughs> well, she, she was, busted she was in the chamber um, right after I got there yesterday morning on 738, pulling out microphones yeah. and just. He was? It, yeah, exclaiming for the world to hear that we weren't doing our job. Good. What? Keep, keep them going. You'll be, you'll be able to find out if we're doing our job or not from the outside. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> what else are, are folks here thinking? The inside. This afternoon, after the floor, Kurt's going to give us a present today, right? Yeah. If we get off the floor? We, I think we are today. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, tomorrow, maybe. I don't know. I, I tell you, so bad we get minimum wage and pay family leave behind us, and then we'll have a right, better feeling on the wait. floor. is going to go. Yeah, she's moving for the Senate to vote on the <clears throat> override. Uh, is, medical monitoring? Uh, medical monitoring and the other one, um, gun thing. Just to have some leverage. Are they doing that? No, I, well, I, my feeling that I got yesterday from folks is it's going to be a little while. Oh. On the medical monitor? <laughs> yeah, and the boat. Oh, no. So Kurt's going to go over this <laughs> afternoon with us about all this touring that he did. How much time do I have? Five minutes. 
<laughs> we're, we're, we don't have anything after. Yeah, we're using it as a fill-in because we weren't sure how long. Just Why does that make you feel you're a fill-in? <laughs> you're not even top-billing me. Kurt, Kurt, you're, like a fill-in. Kurt for a while. <laughs> you're a fill-in. talk for a while. You're a fill-in. Because we weren't sure how long we were going to go on the floor. So if, if we're minutes, off the floor sorry. quickly and we come in, we'll start with you. And then, True. this isn't on the schedule, but it just came into my mind. Phil and I, and I think Butch, we got an email this morning from the legislature, from government operations about reports. Maybe we could just quickly go through that because that doesn't that doesn't involve. That's where do we still need these reports or do we repeal them? And we can do that this afternoon. So if you can get that document posted to our web page, and then we can quickly just go through that because that doesn't take too much time because we have to report back I think it's by the 15th or 17th just get that off our plate the other thing too I haven't heard of anything yet if there's anything in budget <coughs> adjustment upstairs and appropriation that impacts our world we mm -hmm. might be receiving something from a pro hmm? out of state beds we'll have to schedule that in real quick um, The retreat? Yeah. They're upstairs right now in healthcare. Yeah. They said they didn't dig it. They said they wanted to call a quarter of the beds. Yeah. Well, that's why we need to ask sure. at least Sarah or somebody else. Sarah. <coughs> well, or somebody to talk about it some of that stuff. Yeah, we had the secretaries that I did. I don't know what to do. Just for informational purposes. There's nothing we can do. Well, if we start taking that with the commissioner, we're going to need somebody here for the retreat. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. He's upstairs. He's upstairs. He's upstairs. Yeah. <coughs> so, what did folks feel about this morning's testimony? There is a lot of loopholes, <laughs> and in those loopholes, some of our inmates are definitely falling into them. I also think it'll be important to hear from other than DOC, you know, like mm -hmm. some of the applicants who are here. Yeah, they were hearing Friday at 10. We're going to hear from the network, Women's Network, <coughs> Friday at 10. Yeah, yeah we just from worked that through the hallway. From who? The uh, Women's Network, whatever it's called. It would also be good to, you know, you talked about the sort of uh, that kind of notification network that you allude to and how it's how it broke down. It might be good to hear from some of those folks too. Personalized rights. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I think one thing too that was interesting was the culture. You know what they said is the culture of sexual abuse and sexual offenses is very different than if you get assaulted in the face. You're not so apt to report it. And and that's true. That's true outside of. Correctional sure. facility. Exactly. So when you're dealing within a correctional facility, it's even worse because you've got somebody who's got power and control over right. you. Yeah. You're being, you know. But I think it is important to find out. And and I keep saying we need the balance here. Are those sexual offenses that occur within the male facilities being reported mm -hmm. to the advocates, to prisoners' rights, or whatever? Is that also being reported or not? And I, I, I don't know. And mm -hmm. to understand what happens when that is reported, what's their standing, and how does it? <coughs> how does well, it, it would we be able to hear from the prisons amongst men? Not talking about, but kind of a general take uh, of her or his, his, you know, what's coming to him or her. The who? The pre ombudsman. Ombudsman? Is there a ombudsman? I believe 
there is, I think, in reading some of this, that I think there was or there was. There's yeah. supposed to be. There's supposed to be. And we could For the Priya, specifically Priya of God's I believe so. <coughs> I haven't had a chance to read. Was it in the uh, uh, rules uh, document? It was this morning. Yeah. On the federal rules? Was it the federal rule piece? It's got to be. Yeah. I believe mm -hmm. so. And that may, you know what? That may be the, the gal that I was talking to this morning. But it's going to testify. Here? No, she's with the Vermont. Right, but they may be acting as the Vermont. Um, um, they chicken. actually, it's a creation of one. So, but who does it go to now? It would be someone, <coughs> someone in DOC, period. Because I was thinking on an advisory would be a step back. Not back from, yes. Which is important to hear. So the conversation that occurred in the hall at our break with with the DOC folks and Phil and myself was <clears throat> DOC was saying, you know, there's so many different parts of the Priya that it would be really good to break down those individual parts. So that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna do the bigger overview with DOC and then break it down. I said, let's start with the auditing because there's committee members that were looking in those reports. And I said, let's start with that. And I've asked them to send to Phil, Butch, and me those breakdown topics that need, you know, that they deal with or part of the PREA so that we can then structure our scheduling based on that. But we're gonna start with just having them do that broad overview and then get into the auditing. Um, and we can do that next week. But on Friday at 10, when I have the Women's Network in, because they're the advocates, the DIVA, the domestic violence folks who are going into the women's facility, they are not going into the male facilities. <coughs> yes. That is, that's. People are just thinking it's only the women. It is not. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, yeah. it's not. There's a lot of male, male inmate. Sex that goes power. on. Sex, sex is, is powerful, power. particularly for folks who are <coughs> males who are sex offenders and pedophiles, particularly yes. pedophiles. I mean, they are preyed upon in our in the correctional facilities by other inmates. I mean, let's be honest about it. I think it's also disproportionate for a third party reporting how much attention we're giving to Chittenden <coughs> and not looking at the severe lapse at some of our other facilities. It's you know, my point is if this had happened in a male facility, would we be as focused? Yeah, totally. It is happening. It is happening. I'm not going to deny it. I don't know the specifics by any means, but that's happening, I'm sure. Look, look, look what happened down in Windsor. With the, right. uh, the, the CO mail. that was fraternizing with a with an inmate, and it was in the papers. You didn't see anybody sitting in a committee room screaming and hollering and yelling. No. You hear a thing. I don't remember anybody doing that, and that was pretty, pretty <coughs> serious. A lot of this is <coughs> so. Any other thoughts? I'd like to look at the training of corrections yes. officers. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. We're going to do that. Yeah. Can, I, can I say something to that? Yeah, go ahead. So I've been sitting here for a long time wondering why every time that I say you ought to be training corrections officers at our state training facility and not off on the boondocks somewhere. Like and I get this bunch of bull crap saying, well, we can't, they won't accept us, they, uh, it's too difficult, it's out of the way. Uh, but now they're where, St. Johnsbury? They're Linden, yeah. Linden. Mm -hmm. And they were down in Waterbury and, and whatever. So they're up there training under their own supervision without looking, nobody else, no over, over, <laughs> oversight of, and they're on the Criminal Justice Training Council. They're on the Governance Committee. Uh, they're, they're, they have their, well, uh, Heather is, uh, I think, vice chair of the Criminal Justice Training Council this year, mm -hmm. which is 
in Pittsburgh, and I'm not advocating this for Pittsburgh, but it's a train, statewide train facility that has capacity. And we've heard, I've heard, oh, you don't have a cell, we don't have a cell down there. <clears throat> Big deal. You know, they built an indoor shooting range. <laughs> right. <laughs> they built a takedown facility in a... Uh, well, this is Pittsburgh. Yeah. And we did the shooting range. Yeah, and, all and then they stuff. built that in-down take, uh, that takedown facility without any... They did it under maintenance. <laughs> so those kind of excuses don't cut it. And, you know, they're living in rented facilities in, uh, in, in, in Linden. Mm -hmm. They don't have on-site okay. housing. Uh, so all those arguments are out the window, other than we just want to do it ourselves. Well, they were also when we moved, closed down the Dale facility yeah. in Waterbury and moved the women to Windsor. Mm -hmm. They took over that space, they the did. complex, yeah. for training. And then when when Irene happened, they moved out. Yeah. Training training is definitely an issue, but I think hiring and recruitment is a huge issue well, too. And, I, and then when I did my little little summer summer study program this summer, all I heard from over and over and over from the, the CEOs was, "We're just getting killed by overtime." Sure. Yeah. And they, yes. they don't have the time to see their families, and they know who wants to do that. So, so then you can't recruit. This afternoon, yeah. this afternoon yeah. I know this is short notice, but we've got more. We're probably going to have more time this afternoon than we had initially thought. Maybe you and Kurt could also talk about that, because Kurt, you did some shadowing of correctional officers. <coughs> so, yeah. you know, just go off the cuff, shoot from the hip. And the same with you, Carl, because you did some real work with DOC this summer. Yeah, I'd be happy and, to talk and about just, that. We can have those yeah. conversations this afternoon. So, talking about shadowing. Sandy Hoskin do the sources. Yeah. We should go shadow for a day. And I went, wait a minute, Sandy. Look at you and me. <laughs> Nobody no, nobody's ever going to think that I'm going to be a correction officer. <laughs> Certainly they're not going to think you're going to be a correction officer. Yeah. So right. maybe shadowing is not the term you should use. <laughs> but it was a good thought. But <laughs> anything else? Nope. So I'm sure you were way more convincing than I may have been. <laughs> I don't think anybody was convinced. <laughs> 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 so is it lunchtime? Yes, it's lunchtime. Uh, what was it? Uh, what was it? Uh, what was it? Uh, what was it? Uh, what was it?